practical guide of orthodoxy and orthopraxia, that is, duties and obligations of every Orthodox Christian family and every struggling faithful Christian who is not neglecting his salvation. Written by Priest Michael. Translated into English by Father Nicholas Pallas. Edited by Father Mark Andrews. Published by Orthodox Kipsi Lee Publications, Thessaloniki, Greece. Sacred Hermitage of St. Athanasios the Great and the Holy Neomartyrs Aklina, Kiriana, and Agrini. It is a newly established sacred hermitage. Please pray for its completion and spiritual progress. But the word of God cannot be bound. 2 Timothy 2.9 My brother and my sister, I ask you a favor. Give this small book as a gift to other brothers of yours who are thirsting for God's word and who have a good disposition to struggle the struggle for Christ's sake, for their salvation, and be certain that your reward will be great in the heavens. You should know that for one soul which will be delivered from sin, a multitude of your own sins will be wiped out in heaven from the book of your earthly life. James 5.20, 1 Peter 4, verse 8. Fellow traveler Orthodox Christians, it is a gospel commandment that we priests should struggle for God's glory and the salvation of people, but also the theologians and all Christians for this purpose with love, that we have a missionary spirit with humility, both clergy and laity, that we love and forgive our parents and fellow men, that the rulers not place burdens difficult to bear on the people, and that they be homeland loving, that the doctors and nurses serve the sick with loving care, that the judges judge with the fear of God, with leniency and righteousness, that we not get angry and not criticize one another, that the merchants and store owners not get excessive gains storing up treasures upon the earth. Matthew 6.19 Greed is a mortal sin. That employees serve brothers with kindness and correctly, that we not blaspheme and hit the weak, the poor and the innocent, that we help and support churches, the poor, and holy monasteries. If we live thus, then no Christian will fall into heresy, since the Holy Spirit will overshadow us and protect all with his divine grace. Faith in Christ does not need logical proofs. Only if our relationship with him is disturbed by weak faith, egotism, and pride, then man seeks logical proofs for his divinity and the delivering and saving work of our philanthropic Lord and God. The seven mysteries are instituted by God, and a presupposition for our participation in them is faith, humility, discipleship, and obedience to our Holy Orthodox Church and the Holy Fathers. Obey your leaders. Beloved brethren in Christ, the briefest path for the purification of our soul from the passions is to constantly call upon the saving names of our Christ and of our All-Holy Virgin Mary, our Panagia, the Holy Fathers. The following brief prayers are a precious gift and blessing of God toward man. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us, and Most Holy Theotoko, save us. My brethren, let us say these salutary words with our lips and our hearts constantly, because they enlighten the noose, calm the heart, burn sin, flog and expel demons, and the foul and evil thoughts which they give us. The commemoration of a saint is the imitation of a saint. Become faithful unto death, and I shall give you the crown of life. Revelations 2.10 Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Matthew 26, verse 41, and Mark chapter 14, verse 38. This book is dedicated to our Orthodox Christian and Macedonian brethren and fellow travelers along the spiritual struggle in Christ of piety, virtue, and love of the homeland throughout the world. Macedonia is one and is Hellenic. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing beseeching him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16, verse 9. 
from there to Philippi, which is the leading city of the district of Macedonia, and a Roman colony. We remained in the city some days. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16, verse 12. Table of Contents, Dedication, Note of Second Edition, Note of First Edition, Chapter on Marriage, Family, Home, Chapter on Attending Church, Chapter on the Seven Mysteries of Orthodoxy, Brief Chapter on Divine Communion, Practical and Ecclesiastical Issues and Topics, Ecclesiastical Ministry Offices, A Chapter on Dreams and Visions, a Chapter on On the Road at Work, on visitations and meals, on dress, on what's happening with the television, on spiritual topics, a chapter on mo memorials and the two types of holy water services, the great and the small, clarifying about the great holy water service, on the eve of theophany, various heresies, a chapter on fasts, how many and which they are, a chapter on the parable of the sower, on the basic differences of the Roman Catholic Church with our orthodoxy, chapter on exhortations and concerning the commemoration of names for mothers of small children, concerning mediums and the likes, about funeral services, chapter on marriage and friendship, chapter on exhortations of the second edition, and finally a closing chapter on the Ten Commandments of Orthodox Spouses. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on and save those who read this simple and humble book and grant them all their requests unto salvation and eternal life, so that they may become partakers and inheritors of your heavenly kingdom. Amen. Note of the Second Edition With much spiritual gladness, joy, and rejoicing, my beloved brethren in Christ, we are in the pleasing position to announce to the pious Orthodox around the world, to our Orthodox Christian brethren, that in a very small period of time, just four months, the first edition, 3,000 copies, they ran out to the glory of God and the salvation of people. Thus, this humble attempt of ours found great response, and the book was loved so much by our Orthodox brethren of other nations that they translated it into their languages. But this book also was appreciated by quite a few brethren of ours who were deceived out of ignorance and were searching for the truth. Being very moved, we also inform our readers that hundreds of our brethren set a new spiritual beginning in their life, while others are struggling to place and implement the humble things which were written. For us, this is the greatest reward and joy, both of the publisher as well as the least author, seeing our brethren progressing spiritually and ascending the ladder of virtues, but in particular making joyous the Holy Trinity, the holy archangels and angels in the ranks of our saints, Pray, my beloved brethren, that the present edition will find the same response, so that God's name may be glorified even more, as many of our fellow traveling brethren will know the truth, so that they may obtain the blessed Orthodox self-knowledge. In closing this small note, I would like to fervently ask the love of our brethren readers, that they not forget in their prayers, and that they also say, A Lord have mercy both for the publisher and his family and colleagues, as also for the author with his following, so that he might find mercy, consolation, help, and strength from the all-good God in his struggle for spiritual recovering and to be granted to see the face of God with the promise that he will also do the same thing, praying at the altar, but also in his private prayers, both for the readers of this humble work as well as for the struggling, blessed Orthodox Christian brothers and sisters of ours around the world. With the love of Christ, the humble and sinful servant of God, Priest Michael. Know ye the truth, and the truth will set you free. John 8, verse 32. Pious obedience is life, disobedience is death. Note of the first edition. To the request of spiritual brethren in Christ that I author a small, useful, and simple little volume, which would refer to the elementary duties and obligations of not only every Orthodox Christian family, but also of every baptized Orthodox Christian. I have been obedient for the glory of God, even though I have no writing talent. 
But I proceeded, hoping in divine grace, which always heals weaknesses and completes what is lacking. Because so many of our Christian brethren are ignorant of so many basic matters of our church, although they are well disposed and are honor-loving souls, and they have the desire to struggle, the good and genuine struggle of our experiential Orthodox faith for Christ's sake. Thus, as an Orthodox priest, having received the mercy of God and the gift of the priesthood, and therefore having not only a knowledge of practical ecclesiastical topics, but also being a soldier of Christ, and with the prayers and blessings of my elder, and responding to their urgings, I offer to them as a comfort this humble manual, written in simplicity and in summary, according to my ability for the enlightenment of the darkness of ignorance, and for the common benefit of the Orthodox. But I do so with much fear, hearing the Apostle Paul saying, lest after preaching to others I myself should be disqualified. 1 Corinthians 9.27 With the thought, however, that the Lord desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2.4, as well as the words of the Lord to the disciples that whosoever does and teaches, Matthew 5.19, I take courage and dare to write this humble work with the salutary intercessions of the Most Holy Theotokos and of the Archangels. Subsequently, all that follows is from the divine law of Christ, the holy tradition of our Church, and the experiential wisdom of the Holy Fathers of our Orthodox Church. Signed, the least of all, Priest Michael, February 19, 1992. The fruits of disobedience are tasteless and don't save, even if our actions are goodwilled. But without obedience, it is a sick spirituality. Marriage, family, home. The family is a small house church. For this reason, it must be firmly established on the unshakable rock named Christ. As a most basic element, the departure into marriage should be accomplished with the purity of the betrothed, and an orthodox ecclesiastical marriage, which is also one of the seven sacraments of our Holy Church. Simultaneously, a spiritual father confessor is needed as a guide to make certain that the journey of marriage, which both spouses are now beginning, will be successful, sanctification and the fulfillment of their spiritual personality being the aim which will lead them to salvation and to eternity, since this also is one of the goals their common life and coexistence. Thus, by their obedience to their spiritual father and guide, they will also avoid the traps which the opponent of our soul, the wicked Satan, sets for us. However, it would be an oversight for us to fail to stress that the spouses must have patience between them and should forbear one another, because thusly they will be granted to become holy and to be found a successful family. Christ our God himself tells us, but he who endures to the end shall be saved, Matthew 10.22. In this way, they will never come to the point of separation nor divorce, which is not at all pleasing to God, but only to the devil, who is often the cause of arguments and disagreements. Let us recall what the apostle of the Gentiles, Paul, writes to the Galatians and to all of us. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, Galatians 6.2 and also to the Hebrews who believed in Christ. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Hebrews 12.1 You see, my beloved brethren, how many places the Holy Scripture reminds us of the great virtue of patience. Furthermore, we should say that it is a law and commandment of God. We can obtain this great virtue, however, only by trampling underfoot our egotism, by avoiding excessive and many times irrational demands and various words which do not benefit relations between spouses, whether they are said supposedly as jokes or whether seriously. Also, the spouses must possess love and support and unselfishness because love also is a command of God. Those spouses setting out with these basic presuppositions and living a conscientious Christian life will be peaceful. They will progress spiritually and will begin little by little to experience a foretaste of a portion of paradise. When they baptize the children which God may grant them, they must give them Orthodox Christian names 
and if parents, in-laws, or other relatives intervene and urge them to do something different, they should consult their father and guide. Parents should not neglect to pace a holy cross upon their children, as well as themselves and not eyes and zodiacs and anchors and horseshoes or plain chains. The church chants and loudly shouts for centuries now that, quote, The cross is the guardian of the whole world. The cross is the beauty of the church. The cross is the strengthening of kings. The cross is the support of the faithful. The cross is the glory of angels and the wounding of the demons. End quote from the hymnology of our church. They should furthermore attempt to instruct and have their children understand that they should not dress in carnival-looking costumes or go to dangerous, probably sinful places of supposed entertainment, because this secular habit, not to say idol-worshipping also, does not benefit at all. On the contrary, it creates unnecessary expenses and probably problems in the family as well. It harms the soul. The main reason being that we do not comfort our all-good God and Father. If we wish to be careful, we will see that the greater number of crimes, thefts, mockings, and many antisocial works occur, unfortunately, at the hands of our fellow men who are so-called partying. In the home, there absolutely and necessarily must be in an easily accessible and quiet corner and on some wall, preferably one facing eastward, But if this isn't possible, then even elsewhere. A place with a holy cross in the center, an icon of our Savior Christ on the right, an icon of the Most Holy Theotokos on the left, and below, if possible, an icon with the saints which honor us and which we honor by carrying their names. It is not absolutely necessary for us to have a traditional iconostasis, which furthermore many times is often placed at a level too high to be reached easily, Editors note this references to a wooden case with doors often found in homes in Greece in which icons and candles, oil, and so forth are kept. Having hung the holy icons on the wall in this manner, we can place a small table directly beneath them or a bit higher, a shelf if we have small children. On it, we can place a vigil lamp in which we will burn olive oil, not seed oils. Some people out of ignorance use burned oils or seed oils, corn oil, vegetable oil, and so forth, making the excuse that olive oil does not burn well in the vigil lamp. For information's sake, we must say that there are very many virgin olive oils available which burn wonderfully in the vigil lamp. Olive oil has a special symbolic character for our church and her holy tradition. We see that all the sacred books which refer to various prayers speak only about olive oil, not about sunflower seed oil, corn oil, or soya oil. Furthermore, if we recall the dove which the prophet Noah set free from the ark after the flood, we see that it returned having in its mouth an olive branch, a symbol of reconciliation and peace. For this reason, it will be good for us to not adulterate tradition. It is good for the vigil lamp in the home to be lit always, and absolutely on every Saturday and Sunday cycle, on great feasts, and also at night. It is a good thing, though, for it to be sleepless, because this will be a great blessing, as long as, of course, the life of the inhabitants is godly, Christ-centered, and humble. It also has the symbolical character that we confess our hope in God that our faith is alive and shines everywhere, is inflamed and longs for, and with constant preparation, seeks the heavenly kingdom. In general, we see that in the home, and especially in that corner, there is distinct grace and blessing, aside from the fact that the olive oil which we put in is a small offering to the giver of all goods. And let us not have a greedy thought about the expense of the olive oil, because our all-good God and Father has his way of repaying. Next to the vigil lamp, the candili, let us place the censer, with which we will sense the icons. Afterwards, let us sense the living icons of God, in other words, the people who are at home, then the whole house. And finally, if possible, let us leave it out on the balcony for the holy incense to give its beautiful fragrance to all of nature and the creation of God. We remind you that we should be careful 
and always light the charcoal outside on the balcony or in another safe place, since many times it bursts and scatters sparks in the home and there is a danger of fire or damage. We should never use alcohol or lighter fluid to light the charcoal as there is the danger of an accident. To light it, let us use a thin, genuine monastery beeswax taper, because the thick paraffin candles drip and they smell bad. So to this blessed corner, where the lit vigil lamp and the fragrance of the incense give contrition to the soul, we come one by one, or all together, the father, the mother, and the children, to converse with our Heavenly Father, who adorned us with the particular gift of communicating and conversing with Him in prayer, as rational beings, as opposed to all the other creatures which do not have reasoning, nor even spiritual struggle, nor for them is there either hell or paradise after their earthly life. In praying, let us ask Him to enlighten our mind and our heart so that we can obtain self-knowledge for the salvation of our soul, that He will strengthen us in the struggle of the present temporal life, that He will bear the weight of our many cares and obligations, and that He will solve whatever problems which may appear and occupy us. Furthermore, let us ask that He grant us our daily bread. Let us ask Him to forgive us for our neglects, our faults, and our sins, that He keep us healthy not only in soul but also in body, that He guide us in every good deed which pleases Him, that He grant us the spiritual gifts of simplicity and of love for Him, and that He grant to all His creatures and creations humility, and that He also add faith to us as well. Thus, should we depart either for our work or for our sleep and the rest of the night, Parents should not neglect to instruct their children with discernment by word and also by their example, those things concerning the Orthodox faith, love for God, for man, and for all of creation, as well as love for the homeland. Also about humility, chastity, righteousness, divine communion. Especially we should teach them to hold a particular love toward the divine institution of the Church of Christ and its priests, who are between heaven and earth so that they can impart the things of God to men and the things of man to the God-man, the Theanthropos, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ as intercessors. Furthermore, parents should urge them never to hesitate to confess that they believe in and love Christ. Our Panagia, the All-Holy Virgin Mary, and our saints, who were granted to please Christ our God, and for this reason the Lord glorified them in return by making them gods by grace. Our Christ, as is known, is God by nature, and the proof is that he deified them, and that subsequently, on their part, we have many miracles and even resurrections of the dead as well. Also, parents should not neglect to teach them that they should make the sign of the cross, not only when they pass by Orthodox churches, but also when they leave the house. This is a blessed habit, which we often find among many young boys and girls, and which not only causes us older people to rejoice when we see it, but also sets a good example for us to follow. Because when the Christian is thus sealed, whether he is old or young, he himself will be benefited and will escape many traps of Satan. Many people make the mistake of believing that when they raise their children in this blessed spirit, they might become priests or monks or nuns. And this thought troubles them and distresses them. I don't know why, for this is a gift of God and a great blessing. Some parents reach the point of preferring that their children sail and live in the murky and filthy waters of secular life, near Satan, in clubs, cafeterias, bars, with their electronic games, wastefulness, drinking, narcotics, and so forth, and in danger of all things unethical rather than in the crystalline clear and absolutely pure waters of spiritual life near Christ, the church and her teaching, which, as we said, enlightens the children and makes them joyous, optimistic, hopeful for the future, and gives them a disposition toward spiritual struggle. They make, however, a great mistake and hard themselves with this train of thought because such delicate spiritual matters as these, not only the priesthood, but our whole life are arranged by the all-wise God and if someone or a certain soul cannot bear and lift this heavy cross, 
The Lord does not allow it, because these things are written from above in the book of the heavens. And we must know that for someone to become a monk or priest, he receives an individual invitation from God. A proof for this is that so many, many businessmen, scholars, employees with noteworthy careers, such as doctors, lawyers, teachers, professors, officers, merchants, architects, nuclear scientists, and so many other successful people in life become monks and priests of the highest. The all-wise God arranges these things, however, from above because he is the God of the living and not of the dead, as certain people wrongly believe, who stance on this topic and many others shows that the Lord's words apply to them. God is n not the God of the dead, but of the living. Therefore, you are greatly deceived. Mark twelve twenty seven. It would be a great blessing for every person to absolutely entrust all of his life, as did the righteous Job, to our all-good God and Father, who always works for our salvation, and to be granted to reach the point of saying with all the saints of our church, we lay down our whole life and hope unto you, O philanthropic master. Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. It is also a blessed custom for Christian families never to forget to offer their prayers, both when sitting down to eat and when getting up, for thus God will never leave them hungry and there will always be blessing in the house. When children are raised with these presuppositions and in this spirit and atmosphere, they will reach adulthood and enter into the sea of life with sufficient spiritual provisions. Our society will progress, and the parents will not only taste their fruits and be happy, but they will also receive great payment from God as well. The family should also not forget to take its gifts, such as prosphoron, to the Church of Christ. If it is possible to make this at home, and we can make it with yeast from the flowers of the cross, it will be even better. Then the prosphoron is sent to the church on Saturday Vespers, wrapped in a white towel, which we keep apart for this purpose because it has a symbolic character. It will be returned to us when we leave the prosphoron at church, together with two separate clean little papers, on which we will write the names on one of the living and on the other, with a cross at the top, of our brethren who have fallen asleep, who have so much need for us to remember them in our prayers. But if we cannot go to Vespers, we will have to take the prosphoron early, on Sunday morning, so that the priest can lift it up and take out the proper portions for the names of the living and departed which we offered. This also applies for any other feast whatsoever on which we will take our prosphora to the church. Another great blessing also is from time to time to take a bottle of oil for the vigil lamps of the church or special wine for divine communion. Thus, slowly but slowly, by our stance, we will attract the grace of God and we will have the protection of the Holy Trinity, of the Most Holy Theotokos, of the Holy Archangels, and of all the saints. We must be careful to note, however, that we shall not cease having temptations just because we have done these things because all that we have done is ordained for us as Orthodox Christians. We will have temptations, but they will be only as much as we will be able to bear, because God in this manner works out our salvation, and again wants to make us as much as possible more perfect, more holy, more prudent, more humble, more patient. Thus all wisdom of God this all wisdom of God, the God-bearing fathers call the education of God. Simultaneously, however, when we endure temptations with bravery and trust in God, we become imitators of Christ and of the holy martyrs. And as the holy fathers say, we receive meritic crowns from various trials and illnesses, affliction, and death. Today, the Christians do not experience persecutions or martyrdoms like the first Christians, after the ascension of Christ. For this reason, when they forbear various trials bravely, it is considered as a martyrdom. However, great attention is necessary so that the devil does not fool us and throw us into the sin of despair, because this condition does not have any relationship with the children of God, who entrust all to their heavenly God and Father. Here the fathers advise us that man needs to be brave and hope in the mercy of God so long as he is living 
because the mercy of God pursues us all the days of our life. And furthermore, that on our own we cannot be saved. What saves us is the compassion and love of God for man and our lifelong true repentance. If, however, by mistake we happen to despair, then we must immediately run to our spiritual father and confessor, and he, with his prayer to the Lord and his counsels, will deliver us from this deadly danger and trial also, so long as we obey him. O oh, woe, however, to those who do not have a spiritual guide, because it follows that if they do not manage to overcome it on their own, that despair will create great problems for them, and as many contemporary fathers mention, most inmates of psychiatric hospitals, if they had a spiritual guide and father confessor, would never have reached the doors of these institutions. When mothers give birth to a child, they should call the priest to read the prayers of the first and the eighth day, at which time the name of the child is given. A prayer of half of the 40-day blessing does not exist. Afterwards, if the mother needs to go to the doctor, she can go, because the above prayers cover her, not, however, to dances and strolls for recreation. These are days of cleansing and spiritual preparation, continence and patience. Our Panagia for 40 days after Christmas remained enclosed in her home. So precisely on the 40th day, the mother takes the child and goes to church washed and clean to have the 40-day blessing imitating the life of Christ. On some of the following days, she goes and confesses and subsequently the following Sunday communes of the Immaculate Mysteries. Thus, the great blessing is completed in the home of the spouses. With this Blessed preparation, how can the tempter find a place to bother people? This is true faith and real Orthodox life. Our Christ and God became a man to make man a God by grace. What great love and honor! Attending Church As we said above, in order to acquire God's grace and to advance spiritually, every Orthodox Christian family and believer must attend church and participate conscientiously and not mechanically in the worship life of our church. It is inconceivable to be an Orthodox Christian and not attend church and say, I am a good man, I do good works, or I do not harm anyone, I believe in God, but I cannot attend church. Let us be careful, my brethren, because this is a temptation and a betrayal of salvation. For this reason, man must struggle to heal this illness. Once, when the Christians asked St. John of the latter, When do we know that a soul is ill? He answered, When a man does not want to attend church. It is as if we met some beloved person on the road whom we love and they love us, and we neither greeted them nor went to their homes to visit them. What kind of love is this? In church, when we attend liturgy, we should go as early as possible. Of course, not only to enjoy the chanting, as certain people say, to please our hearing. For this reason, they always seek for good surrounding priests or chanters. While this is good, our main purpose must be our sanctification and the ground of, our, of the church and our communication with God in prayer, and then afterwards, all the other things. On Sundays and usually on the great feasts, matins, Orthos begins usually at 8.30 in the morning and ends around 9.30 to 10, and immediately afterwards we enter into the Divine Liturgy, which begins with the priest's exclamation, Blessed is the kingdom of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever and to the ages of ages. Amen. It would be an oversight if we failed to stress that at this moment all the faithful in the Church should be standing. Afterwards, we can, if we wish, sit down. It would be good if we do not know when to stand and when to sit to observe our fellow brethren that are praying. In any case, very briefly and summarily, we would say that we should not sit if there does not exist a serious health reason during the following delicate points of the matins and of the divine liturgy. In the orthos matin service, one when the six psalms are being read. Two, when the priest reads the 
Matin's gospel and subsequently brings it out for us to venerate. 3. During the Panagia's hymn, more honorable than the cherry beam, and 4. At the doxology. And in the divine liturgy, 1. During the blessed is the kingdom, which we mentioned above, evlogimeni, Number two, during the priest's small entrance with the gospel. Three, when gospels are being read. Four, at the great entrance when the priest is holding the precious gifts in his hand. Five, every time the liturgist, the priest, gives us the peace of Christ and the blessing with the peace be to all and when he senses us. Six, at the most delicate moment of the divine liturgy when the Holy Spirit descends to sanctify the precious gifts with the priest saying, Thine own, of thine own, we offer unto thee, and it would be good for the congregation to kneel at this moment, except during the period of bright week through Pentecost and on Sundays, since the Holy Fathers in the 20th article of the First Ecumenical Council say that we do not bend the knee on Sundays. If, however, we cannot kneel for health reasons, or the place where we are in the church does not allow us to, then we should be standing but with bowed head piously praying, because at that moment of the transubstantiation, as the fathers say, our prayer is heard more readily while the living Holy Spirit is among us. 7. When we hear the priest exclaim, Let us attend, the holy things are for the holy. 8. When the creed and the Our Fathers being recited. 9. At with the fear of God with faith and love draw near. At that moment, the priest is offering us to commune the body and blood of Christ. 10. At the dismissal of the divine liturgy, which the priest does together with the through the prayers of our Holy Fathers. Let us also not forget to train our children in the same ecclesiastical piety. The divine liturgy, as we said, begins at around 10 o'clock, ends around 11, 11.30. If we cannot attend Matins Orthos, it would be good at least by 9 to be in the church for the small entrance, which we said occurs with the priest holding the Holy Sacred Gospel. Editors note, but we should arrive late only for good cause, not because it is our family custom or Sunday is our day to sleep late or we read the paper. So, Orthodox Christians should be in attendance at the Divine Liturgy from the Blessed is the Kingdom throughout. However, on the day on which we will commune of the Immaculate Mysteries, we must try to be there earlier to, to participate more in the worship, unless, of course, there is something very serious and urgent in the family which causes us to delay. Even then, we must not get angry and fight with our family members because we did not manage to arrive early, for thus the tempter entraps us. For our participation in every church service, we must, from the previous evening, prepare in soul, but also in body, with vigilance, prayer, silence, without watching television till late, and especially without criticizing, because if we fall into the sins of criticism, anger, pride, and the like, we don't have contrition. Our prayer must become acceptable to God, otherwise we put the comforter to flight, and the soul feels an emptiness inside it. In the Divine Liturgy, let us not allow our mind to wander here and there and all the worldly things and to forget the heavenly things because the Church symbolizes heaven on earth. Let us get used to saying these two prayers also. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, and all holy Theotokos, save us. Kyrie Isu Christe eleison me, and Panagia Theotokos sosame. Because they help us greatly in our attempt to gather the mind in worship and also fill us with grace, it would be very good and a great blessing if we get used to these two brief prayers. We should say them at home, on the road, at work, on trips, in the kitchen, in bed, even in our sleep, in moments of joy, but also moments of temptation because they chase away affliction and they calm us down. In church, we must not pay attention to what man or woman is passing in front of us or next to us, what they're wearing, because thus man is not edified. Let us pay attention to the words of the prayers which the priest is saying and the troparians which the chanter is chanting. Let us especially not leave the church of God before we hear 
through the prayers of our Holy Fathers. Let us take and Diderot, having not eaten, smoked, or drank coffee from twelve midnight onward. If, however, we are taking a certain medicine and we ate, we can take the and Diderot in a napkin to receive the blessing of the priest, and we can eat it the following day without having eaten, always, however, from the hand of the priest, as our grandparents used to say, which sanctified the precious gifts and from the Lord's great condescension brought down the Holy Spirit. Let us piously kiss the priest's hand with our lips and not touch our nose, as some people do. For what reason? I don't know. God knows. Or as certain people who usually just bow, supposedly bowing in a Protestant manner, or else just kiss the priest's cuff. Or even worse, stand with egotism and pride, just stretching out our hand to receive the Andideron and leave in a hurry. It would be good for us to tell you from information we have, that in the Russian Orthodox Church, the faithful do not leave the church if the priest does not leave first. We must also clarify a topic concerning women that when they are undergoing their monthly periodic indisposition, they do not commune, they do not take Andiron, they do not kiss the priest's hand, the icons, the cross, and the gospel. They are not anointed with the unction oil and holy water. They do not make prosphora or koliva, and they do not light the vigil lamp. The same applies for women who have just given birth for 40 days until the 40-day churching in church. From the things we said earlier, I recall many spiritual brethren who sometimes ask, Father, why do so many temptations, many times large and unbearable ones, come to us when we commune, when we go to church, when we attend the holy water service, and so forth. And the answer which is given to them is that something is not going well in their spiritual life, and because God whom we believe in is not comforted seeing us serving and worshipping two masters, that is the ruler of this world, of this age, and also Christ, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Matthew 6.24 For this reason, he sometimes allows such temptations to come upon us. We must realize that the all-seeing God pays attention to everything, and in the day of judgment we will give account for the smallest sins which in this life we did not consider nor pay attention to, either out of indifference or ignorance, which will not be justified, since we are baptized Orthodox Christians, and we must know the law of Christ as his subjects, or, or from egotism, pride, and disbelief, which are mortal sins and completely foreign to the humble, meek, resurrected leader and savior of our faith. Whereas, on the contrary, we must be certain and assured that he forgives all transgressions because he knows the weakness of human nature. It will suffice that he see us struggling before him with humility, obedience, and sincerity in the salutary work of repentance. And if sometimes we fall into sins, let us not despair, but let us hope in the mercy of the Lord, for he came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Matthew 9.13 we must not, however, ever forget that for the humble and the strugglers, there is the sacrament of repentance, and our spiritual father confessor is the, in the place of the Lord. And let us be very careful not to say, yesterday I went to confession and today I fell again. Why should I go again to my spiritual father since I will fall again? No, my brethren, because this is a trap of the devil. The Lord himself told us that even if you fall 70 times 7, that is an infinite number of times, this number is symbolic, get up and you will be saved. St. John Chrysostom tells us the same thing, that even if you fall every day, get up every day with the sacrament of repentance and be saved. It suffices that man cut his bonds slowly, slowly with the secular life of sin and lives a humble and calm life near the church the family, and his elder. So after we take the Andideron and we eat it, taking care that no crumbs fall on the floor, we kiss the holy icons of the narthex, not of the iconostasis, and we depart for home, whether 
where, if we have holy water as we should, we drink three sips in the name of the Holy Trinity, continuing our day with a blessing. On the Lord's Day, on Sundays, we do not work unless it is something very urgent and necessary, or we are employees in shifts, and the nature of our work demands it. On this day, we study spiritual books, or we go to attend homilies of priests, theologians, and spiritual people in church or in halls under the blessing of our Orthodox Church. Let us pay close attention that we not end up and get mixed up in any heretical homilies, sermons, or talks, because the devil if we live in ecclesiastical ignorance and indifference, will leave us with a good impression of these heretical homilies, that, as we usually hear, they speak good words. We should especially not permit ourselves to be swayed to go to heretical gatherings and homilies by supposed friends of ours, or even from relatives and brethren who perchance were deceived. The heretics will not be saved. Here again, our spiritual father and guide has the final word because there are many traps of various heresies within Orthodox and Christian names. In general, on Sundays, in addition to whatever other spiritual struggles we are making, we should occupy ourselves with spiritual work and good works of philanthropy, such as charities, visitations to our sick and sorrowing fellow men, in order to benefit and give joy to our soul which desires these works through which it is nourished and becomes grace-filled. The seven mysteries, sacraments of orthodoxy, which Christ left us that we may be saved. Man is a rational creature, an image of God. For this reason he should repent, confess, tame, limit, and annihilate his passions so that he can reach the likeness of his creator and God. It would be good for us to briefly refer to the seven sacraments of our Most Holy Church, which the heretics essentially reject, even though they seemingly believe in some and others because they are deceived, they reject. They act and preach in such a way so as to confuse the people, and many of our brethren fall into their traps. And certain souls suffer this and are trapped because either they got angry with the Church of Christ because something probably was not pleasing to their ego, or because as Orthodox Christians they lived in indifference and complete ignorance of the invaluable treasure which Orthodoxy possesses. All, however, who threw away and lost Christ from their hands and embrace, who is the gold and the priceless pearl, and ended up in the murky waters and the muds of some heresy, have themselves become persecutors of Christianity and struggle to proselytize other indifferent, naive people also, insisting with great determination on teaching them their deception. The Apostle Paul, in his second letter to Timothy, writes the following, quote, While evil men and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceivers and deceived, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. End quote Timothy chapter 3, verses 13 and 15. What misfortune our wretched brethren worthy of tears have to become, have to become instruments and servants of the wicked demon, and thus deceiving and be, being deceived, they fall into Hades, because a heretic rarely repents. Returning to our subject of the seven sacraments, we wish to say furthermore that these are separated into two categories. The first category has the four obligatory sacraments, and the second has the three voluntary sacraments. In the obligatory ones, great care is especially necessary, because every Orthodox Christian must participate in these in order to be considered a living member of the Church and not to be cut off on his own from her holy trunk, leaving his salvation doubtful. Setting out from these the first is holy baptism, through which man is able to be reborn in Christ through water and the Spirit, from our mother church, 
to cleanse the image of God within in order to be ready to receive the likeness through his participation in the remaining sacraments of our church and to be numbered with the inheritors of God's kingdom, so long as the soul itself struggles the good struggle. For this reason, as we may have noticed, the font has a round shape to symbolize the womb of the mother church from which we are reborn spiritually. This sacred sacrament was instituted by the Lord himself a little before his ascension. His instituting words are, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Matthew twenty-eight nineteen, And go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. Mark 16, verses 15 to 16. Also, during his conversation with Nicodemus, the Lord categorically declared that unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. John 3, 5. Second is holy chrism, with which the newly enlightened Christian is anointed immediately after holy baptism in order to receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which are different for each man according to the Holy Fathers. The material of the Holy Chrism is made of 49 aromatic substances which symbolize the infinite gifts of the Holy Spirit. It is prepared every 10 years on Holy Thursday in a special service at the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople in the presence of representatives of all the Orthodox Patriarchates. The third divinely instituted sacrament obligatory for our salvation, like the two former ones, is sacred confession. I remind of of you of the words of our Lord toward his disciples at the moment in which he instituted the sacrament, blowing upon them with his godly breath, saying, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven them. Whoever sins you retain, they are retained. John 20.22 And again elsewhere as well, Amin, I say unto you, Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Matthew 18.18 Thus, my beloved Christians, it is not necessary for us to say anything to them who deny and reject this great sacrament of our church, because they received the response above from our Lord. Suffice that they search and find and experience discerning and good spiritual father. The fourth and last also great and obligatory sacrament is the Divine Eucharist, which our Lord again instituted on Holy Thursday at the Mystical Supper. This sacrament is celebrated in the Divine Liturgy, which we serve every Sunday and on feasts, or which we can also serve every day, with exception of the weekdays of Great Lent of Pascha, in which we offer as an indication of mourning pre-sanctified Divine Liturgies, in which case the precious gifts are pre-sanctified at a Divine Liturgy on the preceding Saturday or Sunday. Only when the feast days of first and second finding of the head of the precious and holy forerunner of the holy forty martyrs or the annunciation of the Theotokos fall on a Lenten weekday are the regular liturgies of Basil the Great or of St. John Chrysostom celebrated. As we had mentioned also in the chapter concerning attending church, we must participate very frequently in this obligatory sacrament. Furthermore, we should commune the Immaculate Sacraments if we have a blessing from our spiritual Father. Let us again recall our Lord's own words. Jesus therefore said to them, Amin, Amin, I say unto you, if you do not eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will resurrect him in the last day. John 6. Thus, my beloved brethren, closing the category of the obligatory ones with this great sacrament, let us now look at the voluntary ones, which are, first, the great ministry of the priesthood, with the first and greatest high priest and founder of the sacrament, our Savior Christ. In this, whoever wishes and does not have obstacles of sins can become a priest. A second voluntary one is marriage, 
also a great sacrament blessed by our church at the wedding of Cana in Galilee. The third and last one is the sacrament of unction. Whoever wishes can have it served at his home also. This also has great value, for Jesus gave this authority to his disciples, saying that they should heal every illness and expel the wicked and impure spirits from people. The divinely inspired author of the Universal Epistle, St. James, the brother of God, writes, Is any among you sick? Let him call the presbyters of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with the oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick man, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. James 5, 14 to 15. The church, of course, always performs this mystery to sanctify her faithful in the church, but also performs the two previous ones. Constantly say, the Lord Jesus Christ have mercy on me with your heart, and the miracle will happen. Only have faith, humility, patience, love, and hope. Without orthodox faith, it is impossible for us to be saved. Venerable Philotheus Zervakos. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Colossians 3.5 Divine Communion, Practical Ecclesiastical Topics For all church-attending faithful who will come to commune, even greater preparation is necessary. To begin with, before we commune, it is absolutely necessary that we participate in one of the other four obligatory sacraments of our holy orthodoxy, that is, sacred confession. If, however, we have a blessing from our spiritual father and nothing weighs us down so that we can commune without seeing him, then we can do as he appoints. Even so, let us do this conscientiously and not as if we were merely acting out of a good habit. Concerning the eve of the divine liturgy, all we said previously about those who simply attend church holds here too. We should be careful to brush our teeth well. If we are wearing braces and it is possible not to wear them, or on the morning of our communion it would be even better. If, however, this is not possible, it would then take great care as necessary so that the pearls of divine communion are not caught between them. In this case, we must not wash our braces as soon as we go home, nor put them in a glass as certain people have a habit of doing on the same day. If, however, we must do this for some reason, we should pour the water in a clean pot which we have set aside for this purpose, or if we have a garden, we may empty it in some corner where animals do not go. Since we're speaking of such topics, we can furthermore say that we do the same thing with used wicks from the vigil lamp. We can burn them and dispose of them at the same corner of the garden. When we eat koliva from memorials or trisagia, we should be careful that the wheat not fall on the ground. In case we should take them home and forget to eat them and they become hard, we should never throw them in the regular trash, but we should leave them in the same corner of the garden. Or if we do not have a garden, on the roof of our house or in some corner of the balcony in a pot, so that the little birds can eat them. We do the same thing with prosphoron or the crumbs from the andideron, if by mistake they become moldy. Of course, there are many Christians who out of piety eat these even when they have become moldy. However, never, never should we throw these holy things in the trash, because it is a sin. Also, we must say that we do not give them to the chickens or dogs to eat, because these animals also eat impurities. Finally, when we wash newly enlightened and baptized children on the third day, we should place the waters of holy baptism in a clean vessel and take them to church to empty them into a special sink or dry well. God is very pleased by our attention to these things, so we must take care. If, however, we have some question, we should consult our spiritual father and guide. We return now to the manner in which we should commune, and we stress that at the time we approach the holy cup, we should not kiss at that moment the hand of the priest or the holy cup, as certain people do, so that no harm is done, and also so that the congregation is not delayed. We should not rush nor push, 
but follow a certain line and order. We should come, the men from the right and the women from the left and the center of the church should always be free so that those communicating or also those who are taking and deeter on can leave freely and crowding and disorder is not created. At the moment we are communing, we should gather all our senses and be very careful. We should not smile. On the contrary, we should be serious and crushed and, if possible, approach with tears of contrition in our eyes for the great gift and condescension of our God the Father to save us, granting us this, the body and blood itself of his Son and our God. Especially let us draw near with faith, reminding ourselves of what Jesus said to his Apostle Thomas, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and believe. John twenty twenty nine. Furthermore, if we're going to take Holy Communion, let us be careful not to have on our lips creams or ointments, and women should not wear lipstick and have their eyes and face painted, and especially they should not wear pants. We should say our name slowly, making the sign of the cross piously and correctly. Hold the red cloth, the red cloth used especially for Holy Communion, Open below the chin, we should open our mouth wide without being ashamed, and as soon as we feel the spoon in our mouth, then we should close it and wait. The priest will take the spoon without us pushing it out with our tongue. If the pearl is small, we should try to swallow him and not chew him. Editors note the fragments of Holy Communion, that is, the body and blood, are referred to as pearls, for he is the pearl of great price. After we commune, we softly wipe our lips with the red cloth and without allowing it to drop down, we immediately offer it to our brother, the next communicant following us. And most especially, we should not be fearful of Holy Communion because in paradise there are no illnesses and the content of the Holy Cup is a portion of paradise. It is our Christ and God himself, that is, his body and his blood, And those who approach worthily and commune receive health and do not get sick. It is also necessary for us to tell you that at the end of the Divine Liturgy, the priest or the deacon consumes all the remaining contents of the Holy Chalice. We do not commune the small children who are not baptized. Those that are baptized must commune very often in order to become strong and enlightened, if possible, on Saturdays also, or some weekday, on which the Divine Liturgy is held early. The mothers should be careful when they bring their children for communion to hold them on their right arm, simultaneously holding their little hands so that they do not spill the Divine Communion. Many Christians ask if they can, if when they commune during a fasting period, for example, Holy Thursday, Holy Saturday, the Eve of Nativity, once they commune, they can eat whatever foods. No, My beloved brethren, the canons of our Holy Church do not allow this because the fast continues. A breaking of the fast we have for both those who commune and for those who don't commune on those days we mention in the chapter about fasting. At the moment when the priest is consuming the remaining gifts, it is customary at the holy monasteries and also in many churches for the prayers of thanksgiving after divine communion to be read. For this reason, it is good for all those who have communed to remain in the church after the through the prayers to complete the blessing. If they have a job and must leave after the Andiderone, they should read these prayers at home on their own from a prayer book or the special little books which contain the prayers for divine communion. Those who commune should pay attention to a quite serious subject on which there is much confusion. That is, whether they should or should not kiss the priest's hand and the sacred icons. We answer that, yes, we should kiss the hand of the priest and the icons, because as we said earlier, the hand of the priest brought down, though even many times unworthily, the Holy Spirit, which also sanctified the precious gifts. That is, the bread became the body of Christ and the wine his blood, and thus even the hand of the priest was sanctified. If they are concerned that the blood of Christ may perhaps be left upon the hand of the priest, they should remember that first the believer has already wiped his lips with the red cloth, and second, 
that the priest always washes his hands at a special sink at the end of the divine liturgy. As regards the kissing of the sacred icons, we respond as follows. That since as soon the believer goes home, he will place to his lips a cup to drink water and a spoon and fork to eat food, why then should he not kiss the holy and sacred icons of our saints, which veneration and honor of, as the fathers stressed, goes to the prototypes who protect us and who night and day intercede constantly before our heavenly God and Father for the human race. Editor's note, it is also, of course, a pious and praiseworthy custom to refrain from kissing icons, the priest's hand, and so forth, after having received Holy Communion. The author is writing to readers in Greece where Typically, a higher level of spiritual life and preparation can often be expected. Our concern here has more to do with the general lack of knowledge here in America about appropriate behavior and actions in church. We must assume that those who wish to kiss holy icons, the cross, and so forth, will know to wipe their lips very thoroughly with the red cloth after having received Holy Communion. As we recover our Orthodox way of life here in America, it is hoped that the priests will never again have to clean and indeed even consume lipstick, makeup, and so forth from the communion spoon and cloth or wipe these things from the holy icons and the cross from his hand and so forth. To continue, in closing this topic, we ask our fellow Christians not to treat lightly or take as a joke those actions we must perform in church because these are matters of piety and salvation. Christ said it clearly, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Matthew 18, verse 20. Consequently, since Christ our God is present even with two individuals and also with his church, we should not jest nor be irresponsible and superficial, either on the grounds of the church or outside of them. And how much more should we not make jokes to her detriment because God is not mocked. Another topic useful for us to note is that many Christians, when they speak with a priest, use the expression something like, my respects. This is an erroneous expression for an Orthodox Christian because we usually use this expression to those of secular position or government officials. It is not an appropriate expression to use to a bishop and through the bishop to a priest who stand as a type and in the place of Christ. St. Cosmas at Alos, St. John Chrysostom, and many other saints of our church praise the ministry of the priesthood, saying that the priests are higher than any earthly king and also the angels, because the angels dread seeing the priest breaking, distributing, and holding the body and blood of the Lord, whereas to them such grace and authority was not given, but they only serve and escort around the altar table. So the correct expression to use when we communicate with a priest is your blessing. And when we meet a priest or a bishop and we want to receive his blessing, it will be holy for ourselves and also pleasing to God to make a small bending prostration before we kiss his hand. Many Christians ask if they can eat whatever food after they consume a commune in a fasting period, for example, on Holy Thursday, Holy Saturday, Christmas Eve, no, my beloved brethren, the canons of our Holy Church do not allow this because the fast continues. A dissolution of the fast we will have both for those who commune and for the others who don't commune. In those days we mention the chapter concerning fasting. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I shall resurrect him on the last day. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. John 6, verses 54 and 56. Disobedience took us out of paradise. Obedience leads us to paradise and deifies us. Ecclesiastical Ministry, Offices It is noteworthy for us to mention that our Holy Fathers stress to us those Christians who possess Ecclesiastical offices, whether as board members, sacred chanters, caretakers, or whatever else, 
have received a great mercy and are very blessed by God and that these are heavenly offices upon earth. And because of this, they must perform their duties with much fear of God, obedience and support to the priests to be granted paradise. They must know that the priest in the church is struggling not just for himself, nor for his home or his family, but entirely for the divine institution of Christ's church, with the salvation of all the people as his aim. They must also know that when sometimes certain weaknesses or negligence appear in the church, humans that we are, and furthermore sinful ones, we should not publicize them to the people, because gain shall not result but harm. The heretics and enemies of the church are seeking for opportunities to criticize. If we have such a disposition or even character, it is better for us not to accept these offices, because we may lose our soul. Especially, we should not criticize, plot against, or ridicule the priests. The Vesperal Psalm mentions that God made his angel spirits and his liturgists a flame of fire, With simplicity, many fathers tell us that the priest is like the fire, and when you approach him, you will either be warmed with spiritual fervor, thus are pious and God-fearing Orthodox Christians warmed, or you will be burned, thus the impious and priest-criticizing so-called Christians suffer. However, those who serve the church receive great recompense, when in cases of faults or perchance negligence, which as we said are human, They, like Constantine the Great, take from the excess of love in their hearts and spread it, covering these same faults and negligences, which may occur in the domain of the church. Especially the sacred chanters who serve the church must chant with humility at the stand. They should have obedience and piety toward the priests. They should also cover the exhaustion or a certain weakness and neglect of the priests to gain great reward from God and not make faces because of something they did not like, because this shows an antisocial and impious man and furthermore endangers their salvation. They should not be money-hungry, but live a sacramental life, because as a certain contemporary Holy Father of blessed memory used to say, many of the sacred chanters with the gospel and the sacred books in their embrace will lose paradise. Those who serve the church and also all Orthodox Christians must know that the ministry of the priest does not resemble any business because it is dreadfully difficult, so much so that no one can imagine it except sometimes the priest's family members and this because, first, he is physically tired from the responsibility for the cleanliness, proprietary, and the good order of the church. Second, He has liturgical tiredness of soul and body, for as St. Cabasilas says, quote, for one to pray, and especially the priest, for his fellow men to God is like shedding his blood and melting his life, end quote. Third, he has battle from the devil, because all his darts and his evils are directed toward the priests, who ruin all his plans with the sanctifying work which they perform in souls, and because without the priest who is the representative of Christ on earth, people would not be saved. Fourth, he has to deal with all the people, the impious, the indifferent, the lukewarm, the atheists, and heretical people who scorn the church, and especially the priests, whom they also mock at every opportunity. For this reason, my beloved brethren, whoever supports the priests will receive great payment from God, they will also save their souls. Furthermore, we must know that it is not correct for us to comment to the priests concerning a certain neglect or even fault when it does occur. On their own, they will realize it, and with contrition, they will hasten to confess their sin to their own spiritual father. In general, the lay people should not consider that they know all the ecclesiastical subjects or, and that the priests are lacking. We inform you that the lay people do not know all that even the most illiterate priest knows. Because the priest, he lives in the altar and the Church of Christ night and day, morning and night, and he is obligated subsequently to give account to his Master and Savior Christ, St. Cosmas Atolos. It would be holy 
for all Orthodox Christians, if possible, to be eager to serve whenever the Church and those who serve her ask some help in whatever form, because it is a great blessing to help and to serve the house of God with eagerness and joy that is with our heart. Then our service has greater value and our offering to God becomes acceptable because God loves a cheerful giver, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. We should be careful to not approach the church with wickedness for various personal reasons of gain because then we do not gain blessing but judgment and condemnation. Our presence in the church must have one purpose, the glory of God and the benefit of our soul. Only then is man filled with God's grace and glorified by God. Many times we struggle on, even when we might be overly tired or even ill when it concerns our homes or our personal jobs, when, however, on those rare occasions when it is necessary for God to call us, who grants us life, health, and strength through the priest, to offer certain small assistance or work, then certain brethren recall that they have jobs, or they're tired or ill, or they might lose their customers if they have a store, and so forth. They do not know that God might send them double afterwards, or furthermore, that they might go and get ill, or spend money, or even if they do not gain from the church a certain material benefit. Well, they find a thousand and one sinful excuses which man could not imagine. Let us think a little however, of the apostles, and so many saints who left homes, families, wives, children, ships, estates, homelands for God's glory and the salvation both of themselves and of all people, following and serving Christ and the Son of God and Father of us all, and in the end as a crowning of their love, most received a martyr's death. Today from all of the above nothing is asked of us, nor even great sacrifices only a very few things, and if in the end we do not want to do even these, at least let us not make fun of and criticize those who humbly help the Church of Christ, nor let us allow others who have such a disposition to bring detriment to the Church and her people so that we can gain the reward of a confessor. And do you know why a man thinks up all these negative things and shows indifference? Because he probably has not realized that after the physical, earthly death which we will taste, a new life begins, near God, our Creator and Maker, according to the works and the trials we passed. In other words, the exams which were given us in this temporal and ephemeral life that when our soul will ascend to, to heaven, our companion holy angels will present all our good works which we did in the present life and which will become the cause of our salvation together with the other good things we did and the related spiritual struggles we made on earth. Let us pay attention, however, to something more. It might happen at some point during the struggle of our present life, our present spiritual life, which we make for our completion, sanctification and perfection according to our ability. Perchance, by God's allowance, our spiritual father, or perhaps the priest of our perish might even insult us for a certain transgression, neglect, or even sin of ours so that we might recover and be corrected. In this case, not only should we not get angry, but we should accept it as a blessing, as strange as this might seem, because as a certain holy priest who lived in our days used to say with characteristic simplicity to his spiritual children and his parishioners, rejoice when I spank you, because if we leave it, holy God will spank you on the day of judgment, and then things will be very difficult. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as men who will have to give an account. Let them do this joyfully and not sadly, for that would be of no advantage to you. Hebrews 13, verse 17. Dreams, Visions it would be a great oversight if we didn't refer also to a very important topic, that is, the dreams and, perchance, so-called visions, which certain Orthodox Christians see with angels, with saints, with Christ or Panagia, and in which commands or prophetic messages are given them from heaven. Concerning these, almost all the saints of our Church advise us to pay them no attention, whether they are good 
or bad. Here we must show great attention and discernment, because behind these, the all-wicked and false teaching demon might be hiding, whose joy is great when he deceives and deludes people, catching them in this manner from the right. The fathers very characteristically stress that such dreams, as in the above-mentioned case, can be accompanied by pride, vainglory, hypocrisy, falsehood, egotism, heresy, and all the similar sins of soul, with a purpose of leading the person to believe, little by little, with the demon's cooperation, that God has chosen them especially out of very many people as his own instruments. And in this manner, as long as they don't consult a spiritual guide, they can be led to a certain delusion and heresy so as to gather around them naive, ignorant people, and to put down the Orthodox Church together with her priesthood, which was founded by our Lord Jesus Christ, and which has apostolic succession. Furthermore, they are led to believe that they can read prayers, put their hands on sick people, or that they can make the sign of the cross over them, like false prophets, so that they supposedly become well, and thus in this manner deceivingly the demon of heresy overcomes them, so that they will make a distinct religion of their own without seemingly denying orthodoxy. Because of this, great attention is necessary because this is a new system which Satan is implementing with his, the various heresies so that he may deceive people and deprive them of salvation and paradise. Let us also briefly mention, however, the invisible battle of the devil which continues from the left, as again our holy and God-bearing fathers stress to us, which casts us directly into these so-called physical sins, such as drunkenness, pleasure-loving, fornication, gluttony, adultery, murder and abortions, theft, anger, thievery from churches, bestialities, evil desires, smoking, painting faces, adornments, and every comfort of the flesh. Fashion, especially among women, editors note, but in our day, also especially among men. Money-loving, card-playing, gambling, and other things. However, we must remind that for both of these categories of temptations and sins, whether he fights us from the right-hand side or from the left-hand side, there is a strong medicine and antidote which is complete obedience to our spiritual father and confessor. Because only with obedience and sacramental life can we avoid the craftiness, the sneakiness, and the traps which the man-hating ancient snake sets and which many times we cannot perceive on our own. As a result, we just fall into them if we do not have an earthly spiritual father, guide, and confessor. Something else we, we must pay attention to is that we never become prideful thinking that we have defeated him in this life. Because even at the very last moment, when the soul of St. Anthony the Great was ascending to heaven, the evil one attempted to throw him into the trap of pride by telling him, you defeated me, Anthony. The saint perceived his trap and did not respond, but humbly and with the fear of God continued his journey toward heaven, and only when he had entered paradise and was granted to worship Christ did he say, Now I have defeated you. As you see, my beloved brethren, the Christian's life is a constant struggle against the temptations of the devil and the powers of darkness, and for this reason he must live in constant humility and a sacramental ascetical life because only thus will he be able to escape and be delivered in this life from his traps and to inherit the other true life. No to dream interpreters, mediums, sorcerers, cup readers, card readers, astral astrologists, firewalkers, <clears throat> dances, casinos, and various swindlers and advantage takers because they are instruments of the devil and not of God. Only in holy orthodoxy is their divine grace. Don't run to psychoanalysts. Run to Christ through the mystery of sacred confession because here your Creator is present with His divine grace. On the Road at Work When Christians are walking on the street, they're always very careful. Their appearance is humble, their dress modest and dignified, their face joyous, their greeting extended to friends and also to enemies 
if they exist. By necessity, their words are measured without vain talking. Their laughter should not be loud, bursting, and sarcastic, but they should be permeated with the blessed, orthodox, joyful sadness, avoiding extremes and excesses, and their seriousness should not reach a point of sternness so that they think or show others thus that they surpass many of their fellow men. At work, at the office, at the business, at the doctor's office, or at the store, they should be righteous, serving, eager, patient, well-mannered, not money-hungry, charitable, sweet-talking, humble, flexible, speaking few words, avoiding vain and empty talk. We could say that these are a few of the marks of struggling Christians, and when our life and our behavior are seen by people of the world, they are benefited and corrected, and thus the name of God is glorified and we become true light of Christ and the salt of society. As our Lord also characteristically told his disciples, so let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in the heavens. Matthew 5.16 Finally, if God has blessed and abounded over goods so that we maintain our businesses, our stores, estates, and so forth, and we have financial ease, we Christians must support and help as much as we can our financially weak brethren, either offering them work or aid and charity, so that aside from earthly and material things, we may be granted to enjoy the heavenly things also. As the hymnographer vividly and wisely exclaims in the fifth Sunday of the Lent, quote, The kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and abstinence with holiness. And so the rich shall not enter into it, but those who entrust their treasures to the hands of the poor. This is what David the prophet teaches us, saying, The righteous man shows mercy all the day long. His delight is in the Lord, and walking in the light he shall not stumble. All this was written for our admonition, that we should fast and do good. And in exchange for earthly things, may the Lord reward us with the things of heaven. I mean, a request of love, monasteries, and spiritual hermitages of refuge. Open up your doors to the thirsty deers of cities. The images of God who thirst for the word of Christ and spiritual strengthening in these last times we are undergoing. And your reward will be great in the heavens. It should not escape us that the heretics cultivate night and day towns and cities to make followers and to destroy the souls of the Orthodox. May God protect us from ignorance, despair, disbelief, despondency, ingratitude, and the conviction that we can be saved without Christ. A contemporary craft of Satan is to convince people that he does not exist and that everything is perchance. My brethren, if you wish to be saved eternally, Confess frequently, but completely, and thus worthily commune of the Immaculate Mysteries. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 27 and following. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Peter 5, 5. We fervently beseech, let us not tear down our holy and sacred and pious traditions of our nation, because a time will come and we, we will repent, but then it may be too late. The enemies are on the watch. Visitations, meals. In our visits and conversations, we should be careful because people usually expect Orthodox Christians who are struggling spiritually to be upright, to avoid Pharisaic pride or anger and vain, empty, aimless talk and criticism. We should be measured, discerning, and humble in our actions without making bad jokes or hand motions. The publican, as is known, came out justified by Christ because of his humility and self-knowledge. We should try as far as possible to keep our conversations on a high and spiritual level, avoiding extremes, full of love for our fellow man, the church, society, creation, and our homeland. If those present with us have questions of a spiritual nature which we cannot answer, let us refer them to a priest, a spiritual father, so that they can receive a correct answer and let us not risk replying to spiritual questions for which we have not the answer. Good and spiritual company and mutual visitations between spiritual brethren and Christ are pleasant and many times edify, benefit, and renew us, rebaptize us when they have a purely spiritual and Christological character. 
Let us avoid dances, parties, noisy places, and smoking, because in these a man is not rested but becomes exhausted. As for so-called rock music, which certain youths worship, the Holy Fathers say that behind her sounds, Satan is hidden. It will be good and a blessing for us to participate in common meals, as did the first Christians at the agape meals, so that we can converse and be spiritually benefited, always, however, taking care that our chosen is permitted by the canons of our church, which define the days of fasting and non-fasting. Let us not eat meat, cheese, nor eggs, nor fish on Wednesdays and Fridays, and let us keep the great Lent of the Nativity and Pascha, but also the fasts of the Holy Apostles, the fasts of the Dormition of the Theotokos, and let us invite the priest of our parish at least once a year for an unction or holy water service at home. My brethren, you know that our Christ, the God-man, Theanthropos, in the 33 years of his earthly life, never laughed sarcastically, as also St. Lazarus after his resurrection. So become an imitator of our Christ and of the saints. Brethren Christians, struggle against fashion and the nakedness which prevails in our day, and you will gain great blessing from God as holy confessors of the faith. The Lord told the God-seeing Moses, quote, It is not allowed for the women to wear men's clothing, nor for the man to wear female adornments, because each one who does these things is abhorrent and disgusting before the Lord God. Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. Dress. As for the topic of dress, both men and women must be careful when they go to church. Men, especially in the summer, should be careful not to wear transparent shirts without t-shirts beneath and tight-fitting or short pants, because this is an impiety. It would be good for them to wear a suit or a jacket or a shirt with serious long sleeves. The hair should be kept neat without the use of fragrances, especially heavy ones, so that we not give cause for our brethren in the church to notice us and have criticizing thoughts, but also outside the sacred church as well. The women should be even more careful so as to receive God's blessing instead of judgment and condemnation as the Holy Fathers of our church stress. Basically, they should pay attention to the following. They should not enter into the church with short, tight-fitting or offensive dresses or pants, pant dresses and the like. Their blouses and shirts also should not be offensive and the buttons half open because the mind of man diligently lies upon wickedness. For this reason, people should have prudence and chastity and take precautions so that they not offend their fellow human beings, mainly though so that they don't upset Christ. Their hair should not be far-fetched and outlandish according to fashion. They should not paint themselves when they go to church, and especially when they will commune. But why not as well forego this outside of the church as well? Because God, whom we go to worship and to ask for our salvation, wants us as he created us and is not comforted when we alter our natural beauty. They should also be careful not to wear earrings or rings on all the fingers of their hands and many necklaces, bracelets, and jewels because the church is a place of humility. Editor's note, we must also point out, unfortunately, that it is inappropriate for men to wear earrings at any time, but especially in church. To continue, we should not converse either inside or outside the church about other various topics, whether they're good or bad, or judge or criticize priests, chanters, church caretakers, and fellow worshipers, because we must know that after criticizing, many temptations will follow us. The beauty of women with makeup, offensive dresses, adornments, and in general, their careless and unchaste behavior are causes for the Christian struggler to fall into sin. So much attention is needed, my sisters, St. Isaac the Syrian. Beloved brethren, fiercely resist the legalization of sin, and Christ will be your protector and helper in every good and saving work. I mean. 
what's happening with the television? All the God-bearing Holy Fathers used to say, be careful what your eyes are seeing because from seeing, loving is born. That is from seeing, eros and sin are born. From the experience which the spiritual fathers and confessors have, it is ascertained that many young people, elderly people, and children fall into sin on account of the televisions which are in their homes. One blessed struggling Orthodox Christian and family head used to say the following about the television, quote, I delayed a little to understand it. Around great Lent of Pascha of the saving year 1980, I began pondering and said with my thought, how are we losing our time thus passively in front of the television? What chaff is that which is feeding us? Until with the grace of our Christ and our God, but also with our own will, after a little while, we threw away from our house the satanic box and felt that we are children of God. In our home came true blessing. Now we have time for prayer, for family communication and discussions, for studying the word of God. In our house, calmness and peace prevails. Christian homilies of Orthodox fathers and Byzantine hymns from cassettes or from Orthodox Christian radio stations are heard which exist in cities and towns. Our life became truly Orthodox and Christian. We attend church every Sunday and on great feasts. We go to Vespers and supplication services as faithful people lived in ancient and blessed years. We are not influenced anymore from prosperitous and modern messages which the television was sending us. We escaped from the naked and wretched sights from so many corrupting messages which the materialists and soul-killing so-called protectors of the people were feeding us on a daily basis. We passively observed them in their channels, whether we wanted them or not. Precisely here, the revolution occurred inside me, and I reacted blessedly. We no longer see groups brought from abroad, far-fetched and insane. We don't hear rock music, which is demonic, because when they write the records, they call upon and shout to Satan, and even do human sacrifices, together with black and white magic, for the record to be successful and to have many sales, with the utter goal being profit, money, and mammon. Thus many people, and especially the young, who many times are unprotected spiritually, become dependent on the evil and sin. They are drawn by rock music and become easily influenced by the messages which the satanic music sends, like narcotics, Satan, death, suicide, free and beastly sex, down with marriage, and so forth. After these, the souls become languid and don't think of anything noteworthy and serious, and their orthodox personality, their hypostasis, the personhood, is lost. Divine grace leaves, which they had gotten with holy baptism. From all these continues the struggling and blessed family man, we also did not remain uninfluenced. Many times, furthermore, we could not sleep at night. We would see nightmares, and our nervous system was always taut and shaken. Now we sleep calmly and with the guardian angel of our souls as protector who always remains near us, while before we were chasing him away with the things we were listening to. May the name of the Trinitarian God, our All-Holy Lady the Theotokos, and all the saints be blessed and glorified. To continue, we should know, my brethren, that the television does great harm to man, both soul and body, with the unchaste and filthy sights and advertisements and serials, but also the contemporary materialistic and corrupting messages which the small screen presents the soul is harmed many times without being able to be repaired. Man is loaded with sins and departs from God and from his fellow man. The laser rays send harm to the body in the long term. Furthermore, many doctors forbid their children from seeing television. We feel the need to inform you furthermore that after a short time, the following will also happen with the televisions. Aside from the images which it will transport and give to the homes, it will have the ability to take images as well and to photograph the whole house in all spaces. 
It will transport all the secrets of the house, no matter what nature they are, to the Zionistic dark centers of the Antichrist and his underworldly wicked powers, which fight holy orthodoxy and Christianity from its birth. It will be, briefly speaking, the spy for every hour and for every family. Well, all these will prepare the worldwide dictatorship of the Antichrist. See the book of the Revelation, chapters 13, 14, and 15. Thus, when the abomination comes, it will be able to control the whole world. The same will occur with the universal barcode system and with the various computers. St. Cosmas at Alos used to say, the Alala and the Balala, the inanimate objects, will destroy humanity. It is certain that whoever of the Orthodox Christians don't have this box of Satan in their homes, thus St. Cosmas at Alos had prophesied about it and called it, will gain great blessing from our soul-saving Savior and Lord. Readers note St. Cosmas at Tolos, St. Ephraim of Arizona, both from Philotheu, Holy Mountain, to continue. Probably my brethren will also be become witnesses of these dreadful events, when these unbelievable and dreadful things will be occurring in the directly following years which are now approaching. For this reason, let us not take these subjects as a joke. Noah and Lot believed in the things which the angel of the Lord announced and they were saved. Whichever families take the televisions from their homes, it is certain that they will escape from very great temptations, but also the blessing from God will be very great because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit will come to dwell in that home and will make it a habitation according to our Christ's promise. John fourteen two. what a great blessing. Try it and you will be assured of this truth. We returned to the topic and added, adding we mentioned that the closing of the television was also implemented by European non-Orthodox people because they saw the change which their people underwent and that the institution of the family was deeply shaken. For this reason, they implemented the closing of the television and the video once a week so that the family members might have contact with one another's souls, but also time for spiritual conversation and study, and which day they named the Day of the Family. Think, my brethren, we Orthodox, with sensitivity for the family, the tradition and the moral values, how much more sensitive ought we to be to this topic? Pray that God enlightens us all to allow to always to do his, his will. Thy will be done and may be granted to save our souls and bodies eternally. Amen. It is a grave sin for us to blaspheme the divine, the sacred, and the holy things. Our prayer and communication with God the Father, our creator and maker, is a great blessing. Let us guard the great and first medicine of salvation, the inheritance of good faith, confessing with soul and mouth with boldness, as our fathers taught us. St. Maximus the Confessor. Spiritual Topics. It would be also useful for us to refer to a topic of which most Christians are probably ignorant, that every day of the week is dedicated by our Holy Church as follows. Sunday, to the life-bearing resurrection from the tomb of our Lord to remind us both of his own resurrection as well as of our own, which will be unto the resurrection of life, as long as we act worthy of the name of an Orthodox Christian with faith and good works, but unto the resurrection of judgment if we act foully with disbelief or even indifference. These are the words of our Savior himself. John 5.29 Monday, dedicated to the holy archangels, Michael and Gabriel. Tuesday, to the baptizer of our saint, St. John, the holy forerunner and Baptist. Wednesday, to the dormition of the most holy Theotokos. Thursday, to the Holy Apostles and St. Nicholas, Friday to the precious and life-giving cross, Saturday to all saints and to our brethren who have fallen asleep. As the God-bearing fathers urge us, it will be soul-saving and very beneficial for us to accustom ourselves to saying the short, brief, but saving prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. From morning to night and all during the night if possible, thus implementing the Apostle Paul's saying, pray without ceasing. This prayer has very great strength because it chases away the demons and foul and evil thoughts. It cleanses, 
It sanctifies, it calms, it enlightens man, and attracts the grace of God. If we cannot say the prayer with such intensity and expanse, let us say it as much as we are able and try to remember it as often as possible because we will feel great benefit from it. If, however, we wish to try and to struggle more, holding the prayer of the Lord in our heart so that it fills the heart and becomes ceaseless after quite a few years of practice in conjunction with other related spiritual struggles, then slowly but slowly, the soul will pass through the stage of purification to the stage of enlightenment, which also has a final goal to live always in piety and the final state of man, sanctification or deification, which is also was the state of man before the fall. Theosis, according to the grace which our Lord Jesus Christ and God granted us with his incarnation, being God in essence, and for which we ought to feel a great debt of gratitude and love to the point of sacrificing our life itself if necessary, like all the martyrs. Simultaneously with the prayer of our Lord, we can remember on Monday to entreat the holy archangels, saying, holy archangels intercede for us. On Tuesday, St. John the Forerunner intercede for us. On Wednesdays, most holy Theotokos save us. To the Theotokos, we do not say intercede, but save, because she has great boldness before her God and Son, and when she intercedes, he saves people. It is good for us to call upon the Most Holy Theotokos as to our Savior Christ, but on Wednesdays, we should recall her in particular, because as we said, this day is dedicated to the one of great grace, our Panagia. On Thursday, we should also say, Holy Apostles and St. Nicholas intercede for us. On Friday, O cross of the Lord, save us by thy strength, because the cross also is an all-powerful weapon of Christians that saves man from great temptations. And finally, on Saturday, we should remember all saints, saying, All saints intercede for us sinners. I mean. Memorials. It would be a great oversight if we didn't also refer to the church triumphant and that all Saturdays of the year are dedicated to our brethren who have fallen asleep, who already are in an eternity, and await, as we said, their resurrection, because the resurrected Christ became the beginning of those asleep, the firstborn from the dead. It would be very good on this day, without, of course, excluding the remaining days of the week, as long as there's a good reason, to offer their memorials or trisagia, because the souls are thus greatly comforted. Let us always be careful, however, not to neglect remembering them on the two annual Great Saturday of Souls, which are first the Saturday before Meet Fair Sunday, when our Church reminds us of the future judgment and the second coming of our Lord, and secondly, the Saturday before the Feast of Pentecost, during which the Church remembers, as in the above-mentioned Saturday, all our pious fathers and brethren who have fallen asleep with the hope of the resurrection and of eternal life. The memorials greatly comfort the pious. Thus, in this manner, the bond between the church militant, us the living, and the church triumphant, our brethren who have fallen asleep, is close and unbreakable, even though we cannot feel it and understand it. For just as we pray for them, for God to comfort them and place them in the land of the living, so that, so that they who are even closer to the all-good God pray for us that the Lord support us and strengthen us in this temporal life and in preparation for our own departure. And something else we should not neglect to mention regarding our brethren who have fallen asleep is that at the memorials of the third day, ninth day, fortieth day, sixth month, ninth month, and the first, second, and th or third year, when we want to have a meal offering, foods or coffee, we, we should prefer to have these meals in an area or hall of the church or at a home. Then we will greatly comfort the souls who already live and see in their majesty the heavenly ranks and kingdom and who now know clearly the salutary work which the Church of Christ performs upon earth. Let us prefer to go for these meals to an area in a hall of the church if it exists or at a home. We should avoid taverns or secular halls where other types of parties and dances occur and which many times have become workshops of wicked entertainments and acts and actions and delights which are irreconcilable with the life of the Orthodox Christian and the life of the Church. 
In particular, if we pay attention to our day, we will see that indifference toward our brethren who have fallen asleep prevails and dominates many areas of life, along with materialism, egotism, and flesh worshiping. Many of our fellow men stubbornly struggle to banish the memory of death from their thought and life, and you often hear them say, don't speak about the dead, or when they do speak about our brethren who have fallen asleep, they do silly things like knock on wood or tables or walls or chairs and other objects. All this is superstition. Or furthermore, they won't go to funeral services and they won't, don't want to see the tombs. So how can our departed brethren be comforted by all these negative things? All of these are in opposition to all the Holy Fathers who stress very much that man must have memory of death which ultimately is the only bridge over which it is certain we shall all pass. All this fear, do you know why? Probably because we're not ready spiritually. We have not put our soul in order, nor are we familiar with the sacraments of our church. The people of God, however, with faith, love, hope, virtue, humility, and obedience, never fear death because they believe in the sacraments of the church and their soul, their hope, and their being is Christ, and their real homeland is heaven near God the Creator and Father of us all. In conclusion, we, we would say that our Orthodox Church and whatever joins the faithful Orthodox Christian to her and her holy mysteries should be the center, whether in joy or sadness. This is very good and pleasing to God and also to our brethren who have fallen asleep the church is a safe sheepfold which guards us from the attacks of the noetic wolf who seeks and searches night and day for a cause to tear any soul to shreds and deprive her of salvation and of paradise. There in the area of the church we will not have great fear of getting out of hand because the grace of God exists, so long, of course, as we have elementary piety. In this atmosphere we must feel that we are in our own home and in the embrace of God, and we should surround it with genuine love, both the place as well as the people in it, who serve, who toil, tire, protect, maintain, and pray to God for the salvation of us all. Especially we should not search to find, and many times unjustly, faults, mistakes, and causes to accuse or criticize priests, giving sustenance and pretexts to the false teachers and heretics who unhesitatingly launch evil underhanded attacks against our Holy Church. We should also know that when we mourn, it is absolutely necessary for us to go to church more often, not only to comfort the souls of our beloved departed ones, but also so that we ourselves are strengthened. We must also participate in all the sacraments and expressions of our church, especially in the resurrectional Paschal Divine Liturgy. We mention these things because there are many brethren who have faulty information concerning the above-mentioned topics. Thus, by our whole stance, which will be distinguished by an ecclesiastical train of thought, genuine love, a pure life, humility, and obedience to the spiritual fathers, we will offer our beloved ones who have fallen asleep in the Lord and left us this temporary homeland, the earth, the best memorial for the comfort of their souls because we must understand that their souls are not comforted by the lighting of the little vigil lamp on the tomb, while our own life and stance before the church is marked by indifference or disbelief, faithlessness, and many times disrespect and no participation in the sacramental life to which Christ invites us. And something very serious which we must note is that we must never think, since it would be a very great sin, that the Church of Christ is a profit-gaining institution, as many deniers and cursors, atheists, heretics, and indifferent Christians of our age, so-called, irresponsibly accuse and slander her, but a divine institution of philanthropy and love. Her whole struggle and attempt is for people to be led to self-knowledge, repentance, and salvation, to be granted to become partakers and inheritors of the heavenly kingdom which the philanthropic God has prepared for us. What happens with the human soul when it sets out on the great trip for eternity? From the moment when the angel of the Lord comes and takes the soul, the demons also come along to reveal the sins which he did on earth and which that person perchance did not confess. They come to accuse him 
if he didn't believe in the mysteries which Christ left to his church. They furthermore accused the soul if it lived with disbelief and did not accept remission of sins from the representatives of Christ, the priests. They reveal all these things. Thus, for three continuous days, the rational creature of God, man, goes through the aerial toll houses to be judged according to his works. For the irrational animals, there is no judgment, nor paradise, nor hell. The time they live on earth, that is what exists for them, and nothing else. They were created to serve man in the work of salvation and his preparation for eternity. On the third day, the soul is led by the angel to the throne of Christ, and he worships the Lord. We here do the first memorial prayer, supplicating Christ to forgive the soul. On the following six days, the angel takes the soul in the areas where the man lived the earth to remember the good deeds which he did, or the evil ones, and the sin. On the ninth day, he is again led to Christ's throne and worships. We here do the second memorial. On the remaining 31 days, the soul is brought by the angel to paradise and to Hades to see that these things which Christ foretold when he came to earth exist and are true. On the 40th day, the soul worships Christ again. We here should do a trisagio, a memorial no matter what day it falls on. If we want an official memorial in church, we can also do it before or after. Christ on the, that 40th day decides to what place he will place the soul, in paradise or in hell. In this state, the soul will temporarily remain till Christ's second coming when the general and impartial judgment occurs. Remember us all, O Lord, in thy kingdom. The memorials, Trisagion, my brethren, should certainly be held to expiate the compassion of God to forgive the reposed brethren simultaneously, though we should do charities also to churches and the holy monasteries which are being built and to the poor. We should study spiritual books, do missionary work to our brethren, that they repent, change direction, and live an orthodox life. However, first, we relatives of the reposed, we should change our way of life, become spiritual people instead of fleshly people, live a sacramental, ascetical life, with confession, church attendance, divine communion, not criticizing our fellow man, much more so God. The 40-day liturgies also greatly benefit. With such predispositions, if the soul which left was condemned for small sins, with our own spiritual struggle and the charities, the soul may be transported to paradise. Thus, the soul also which left is greatly benefited, but we living are also benefited and certainly saved. The little candili, the vigil lamp for 40 days from the repose, should be lit night and day ceaselessly. It would be good for it to be lit always. Also, every Saturday with the name of the reposed, we should also take a prosphora to church, at least for 40 days, but also later on, every now and then with wine and oil. The prayer of the fathers of our church is at the second coming of Christ, that in eternal hell that there be no living human being. However, we must also believe in our Trinitarian God and struggle spiritually and in an orthodox way. Be very careful of the seven deadly sins so that we not end up in Hades. These are pride, avarice, fornication, envy, gluttony, anger, and despondency. That is neglect for the salvation of our souls. Let us guard from these, my brethren, so that Christ pities us and saves us freely. Let us not become slaves of these deadly passions and sins. Man is a noble creation. When we don't love our spiritual fathers whom we see, how is it possible for us to love our Trinitarian God and the saints whom we don't see, but also our most sweet homeland? There's nothing higher than the Holy Orthodox faith, the homeland, the family, and our holy traditions. May God preserve us from ingratitude, ignorance, despair, apostasy, prosperity, and flesh worship. I mean, the two types of holy water, great and lesser. Together with the seven sacraments, which we mentioned above, 
Our Orthodox Church, in order to sanctify and arm her faithful Christians against the merciless enemies of man, the wicked spirits of evil, lethargy, and slander, has also the two holy water services, which she performs in three cases and on three distinct days. The lesser blessing of the waters and the great blessing of the waters, which is performed on the eve and the day of Theophany, and the blessing by the priest of the waters for baptism during the sacrament of holy baptism. The great blessing of the waters, which we perform on the eve and on the day of Theophany, occurs in the church only on these two great days. We do not keep it in our home for the whole year because the church keeps this holy water in the Holy of Holies in the altar and offers it to her faithful when they are in need and in particular when the believer has received a certain canon from his spiritual father, a penance not to commune of the Immaculate Sacraments because of various grave sins which he committed, but is allowed to partake only of the great holy water from the church. However, on these two great days, the eve and the day of Theophany, before eating anything, we can both sprinkle our homes and drink it until the leave-taking of the feast. We can hold the service of the lesser blessing of the holy water whenever we wish, Aside from the church, which offers it almost every first day of the month, it is held even in homes, stores, schools, hospitals, and institutions, army camps, fields on cars, boats, airplanes, and wherever there are Orthodox Christians who desire their sanctification and God's blessing. We can keep this water at home in a clean bottle and use it whenever necessary. It would be good to glue a label on the outside of the bottle and write on it, Holy Water so that it is not thrown away by mistake. Furthermore, it will be a great blessing every morning for Orthodox Christians to begin their day by drinking a little holy water before eating or drinking anything else. Before the holy water is used up, water can be added from the faucet. If, however, we also have at home andideron, we will eat a piece of andideron first because it was elevated, sanctified, and blessed in the sacrament of the divine Eucharist before the body and blood of Christ. And then we will drink the holy water which was sanctified in the water blessing service. A serious topic which families must pay attention to is that when a priest is invited to a house for a holy water or holy unction service, many times the dress of the lady of the house or the daughter and of the son is not appropriate, but outlandish, scandalous and offensive, even to the point of many of our sisters wearing out of ignorance shorts and very tight-fitting dresses, or even long pants, which is not proper. For this reason, we make this fervent supplication. Let us pay attention to this point of piety and be careful so that we can attract the grace of God and so that the All-Holy Spirit will descend, overshadow, and sanctify both the house and those who dwell in it. Also, at the time when the priest is to come to perform any service whatsoever. The room, the house, should not smell of cigarette smoke, but if possible, holy incense, so that we can thus prepare the appropriate atmosphere in the place where the blessing will come. And again, when the service ends, we should not smoke right away, but wait for the priest to leave first, and then we can proceed as we wish. On the contrary, we must take advantage of the priest's presence in our home to converse with him concerning spiritual subjects, and to find answers to our various questions. And if he is a confessor, a spiritual father, we should take the opportunity to confess our sins, because there is great joy in heaven and on earth for the salvation of men. Clarifying about the great holy water service, the eve of Theophany and, and various heresies. From the day of nativity until the 4th of January, the eve, the eve of Theophany, our church officially appointed that we not fast even on Wednesday or nor Friday. We have, that is, a breaking of the fast in everything for the period of the 12 days of Christmas. The fathers identify this period with the period of renewal week, where the faithful can eat whatsoever and can commun commune the next day, those who are continent, of course, after conferring with their spiritual father. So on the eve of Theophany, when the great holy water service occurs, we can partake of it regardless of whether we fasted from foods the previous eve. Abstinence in the other things is necessary. The fast of the eve occurs because the next day we have a very great feast of the Master, as on the eve of Christmas, 
and on Holy Saturday when we fast without olive oil. These great holy water services on these days we drink without eating anything and before taking Andidoro also. The great holy water service we should finish by the leave taking of the feast on the 14th of January. The church always has some if we need. The papists, when they make holy water, in a short while it becomes green. And for this reason, they come up with throwing salt in their holy water, and this because they don't have the divine grace. They were cut off out of egotism on their own from our paternal one holy Catholic and apostolic Orthodox Church in 1050 AD, and they were self-proclaimed as a Catholic Church. And from them, all the various heresies came, such as the Protestants and all the groups that broke from them. Be careful of the many heresies and false teachings which abound, such as Pentecostalism, the pseudo-martyrs of Jehovah, Jehovah Witnesses, or the Evangelicals of the Good News, the Mormons, the Adventists, Gnosticism of ancient religions, Freemasonry, Theophysy, New Acropolis, New Age, Children of God, UFO movements, Yoga, Centers for Meditation, Rastacrucians, Centers for Health and Ecology, Internal Christianity. Be careful of the Pentecostal TV channel of Greece 62 and to the heretical radio stations. If they don't put and play Byzantine Orthodox hymns, don't listen to them, for there's a danger in eternal death. Don't let your children listen to rock music and heavy metal because it is demonic. A heretical person after the first and second council Give up. Titus 3.10 Jesus Christ yesterday and today is the same un un unto the ages. Hebrews 13.8 While this race of demons does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Matthew 17.21 Fasts. How many and which are they? We have already mentioned the fasts in general, however, it would be good for us to refer to them more analytically because many Christians do not know them and always ask about them. Fasting, as we ought to know, was instituted by God himself. In the New Testament, our Christ first fasted for 40 days and only then began his salutary preaching on earth. And also from the Old Testament, we know that before receiving the Ten Commandments from God himself on the God-trodden Mount Sinai, the prophet Moses fasted for 40 days. Thus, summarily and in proof, we respond to those who reject the command of fasting. And let us not forget that for this reason, because they did not obey and did not fast, our foremother Eve and also our forefather Adam lost and ended up outside of blessed paradise. According to the holy fathers of our church, fasting curbs the passions, strengthens man spiritually, subdues and expels demons, gives contrition, enlightenment, and purity to the soul, makes the mind and the body as well healthy, and most importantly, we please God. Thanks to our Savior Jesus Christ, we Orthodox Christians, by struggling the good struggle of our living faith, and with all the other virtues and with fasting, can regain the lost paradise of delight. The fasts, as they begin almost from the beginning of the year, are as follows. First, from Nativity, from Christmas Day until January 4th, the period of the 12 days of Christmas. All foods are permitted, even on Wednesdays and Fridays. Second, on January 5th, the eve of Theophany, we eat only foods without oil. However, it happens to fall on a Saturday or Sunday, foods with oil are permitted. Third, Holy Theophany is a fast-free day, even if it falls on a Wednesday or Friday. Fourth, if the presentation of our Savior Jesus Christ to the temple on February 2nd falls on a Wednesday or Friday, fish is permitted. If it falls on another day, all foods are permitted. Fifth, the week from the Sunday of the publican and the Pharisee, which begins with the triodian, till the following Sunday of the prodigal son is a fast-free week. We can eat anything even on Wednesday and Friday during that week. Sixth, the week from the Sunday of the Prodigal Son till Meat Fair Sunday is a normal week, like any during the whole year. That is, we, we're careful not to eat meat, milk products, cheese products, and fish on Wednesdays and Fridays. Seventh, 
On Meat Fair Sunday, we are permitted if we wish to eat meat. After this day, the canons of our Holy Church allow us to eat meat again only on the night after the Resurrectional Divine Liturgy. In the week following Meat Fair Sunday, however, till Cheese Fair Sunday, as some call it, all milk products, cheese products, fish, and eggs are permitted even on Wednesday and Friday. That week, we say that we have a white fast. Eighth, the day after Cheese Fair Sunday, which is Clean Monday, Great and Holy Lent of Pascha begins. On this day, we have only dry foods, that is bread, halva, olives, tahini, onion, celery, and the like, zerophagi. Some Christians have a habit of not eating anything on this day, and still others wait until Wednesday morning or the afternoon, in which case they commune of the Immaculate Sacraments in a church which has the pre-sanctified divine liturgy. Ninth, during Great Lent, we do not eat meat, milk products, cheese products, eggs, or fish. We can eat foods with oil, shellfish, squids, clams, octopus, shrimp. However, those who can eat foods without oil, that is, without seed oil, corn oil, or soya oil on Wednesdays and Fridays, will have a higher fast, which is pleasing to God. The Lord, of course, gives strength and an analogous reward to these souls. Here we must note that fasting demands discernment, and it would be good to consult our spiritual father to avoid extremes and excesses. Tenth, on the third Sunday of the fast, which is the Sunday of the veneration of the cross. Again, since it is a Sunday, olive oil is as on all Sundays of Great Lent. If, however, it falls together with the Feast of the Annunciation of the Theotokos, then fish is permitted, but not cheese products. Also, if the day of the Annunciation happens to fall on a day other than Sunday, even Wednesday or Friday, we can again eat fish without, however, having cheese products at the table. On Palm Sunday, we do not eat fish, but foods with oil in view of the reception and our preparation for Holy Week. How in older times it prevailed and to this day we reached a point of eating fish on Palm Sunday, we do not precisely know. Eleventh, from the night after the Resurrectional Divine Liturgy until the Sunday of Thomas is a fast-free week. This week is called Renewal Week, and the whole week is considered by our church to be a single day, a continuous celebration of Pascha. We should also note here regarding the Paschal Liturgy, all the Orthodox Christians should remain until the end of the service, and if they are prepared properly and they commune, they will receive a great blessing, unlike many people who, out of ignorance or indifference or lack of struggling, leave immediately after the Christos Anesti, Christ is risen, to go and eat, being ignorant of or indifferent to the fact that they are depriving themselves of a blessing of the highest importance. To continue, and until the Sunday of Thomas, we have a breaking of the fast and everything. This week is called Renewal Week, and the whole week is considered by our church as if it is one Paschal day. Twelfth, from the day following Thomas Sunday, we fast normally as during the rest of the year. Thirteenth, on mid-Pentecost, which always falls on a Wednesday, we may eat fish if we desire, but not milk or cheese product. Fourteenth, on the day of the leave-taking of Pascha, which again falls on a Wednesday and is always the day before the Feast of the Ascension, fish is permitted, but not milk or dairy. Fifteenth, from the Sunday of Pentecost to the Sunday of All Saints is called the Week of the Holy Spirit, and it is fast-free. Sixteenth, the Fast of the Twelve Apostles begins immediately after the Sunday of All Saints till the eve of the Feast of the First among the Chief Apostles, Peter and Paul. During this fast, there is abstinence from meat, milk, and cheese products. Fish is permitted on Saturdays and Sundays, but not dairy. Seventeenth, on the feast day of the first among the apostles, Saints Peter and Paul, all foods are permitted, unless it falls on a Wednesday or Friday, in which case fish is permitted, but not dairy products. Eighteenth, on the fast of the fifteen days of August, from the first from the fourteenth, we fast as we do during Great Lent before Pascha. On August 6th, which is the transfiguration of the Savior, a feast of the Master, fish is permitted, even if it falls on Wednesday or Friday. But dairy products are not permitted on those two days. It is a feast of the Lord. On August 15th, which is the Dormition of the Theotokos, 
a feast of the mother of God we can if we wish, eat meat also, if the feast, however, happens to fall on a Wednesday or Friday, we again eat fish without dairy product. Nineteenth, on the birthday of St. John the Forerunner and on June 24th and on the Synaxis, January 7th, if it falls on a Wednesday or Friday, we can eat fish on the other day's meat as well. In general, we should know that when in a fast we're eating fish, we never eat cheese products, aside from cheese fair week, on which fish is eaten, because cheese products go along with meat. On the beheading, however, of St. John the Forerunner, which is on August 29th, we always eat unoiled dry foods. On September 14th, the day of the universal elevation of the precious cross, we eat also dried foods, unoiled foods unless it falls on a Saturday or Sunday, in which case we have a breaking of the fast for wine and oil, as also on August 29th, the beheading of St. John the Forerunner. On September 23rd, however, which is his conception, if it falls on a Wednesday or Friday, we eat oil. Also, on the commemorations of great saints, on Wednesday and Friday, we eat oil. When, however, a certain church celebrates its feast day, on these days we can also eat fish. We remind that all Saturdays of the year we have a breaking of the fast for wine and oil, aside from Holy Saturday, when we eat unoiled foods only. In general, during the duration of the ecclesiastical year, on the feasts of the Mother of God, if they fall on a Wednesday or Friday, we have a breaking of the fast for fish, without dairy products and eggs. We note also that on the Holy Mountain, which many fathers call the Ark of our Orthodoxy, during the 40-day fast of the Nativity, they eat fish only on Saturdays and Sundays, and they begin this from the Feast of the Entrance of the Theotokos, as also during the whole duration of the ecclesiastical year. They also have Monday as a fasting day, systematically along with Wednesdays and Fridays as fasting days. We, of course, in the world do not have a very easy time of keeping the Athenite rubric. And so for this reason, the fathers show condescension and understanding in these matters. Those who, of course, desire to implement this rubric, they do not discourage so long as there is an understanding between the spiritual father and the confessee, and so long as everything begins with blessed obedience. Twentieth, the fast of the Lent of Christmas begins immediately after the following day of the Feast of the Apostle Philip, that is from November 15th. From this date until December 17th, we can, aside from Wednesdays and Fridays, eat fish, not, however, cheese products during the whole of the great nativity fast. Also on the feast of the Apostle Philip and on the entrance of the Theotokos, we can eat fish even if it falls on Wednesday or Friday. 21st. From December 18th until December 23rd, we eat only oiled foods, and those who can and wish can eat unoiled foods. It would be a blessing for them, aside from Saturday and Sunday on which we eat oil. On the eve of Nativity, December 24th, we must, of course, eat unoiled food or dry food, unless, again, it happens to be on a Saturday or Sunday. 22nd. On all Saturdays of the year, if we will commune on Sunday, we will eat oil until the noon. That is, there is a fast breaking of wine and oil, as our church characteristically records in her Tipicon concerning fasting, aside from Holy Saturday on which we must eat unoiled or dry foods. There are also two matters concerning fasting which we will take care of with our spiritual guide, because opinions differ. The first is that certain people say that on Holy Thursday we can eat oil, and the second that from Pascha till Pentecost all faithful who commune can on the eve eat oil. Now, if we wish to summarize them and list the fasts numerically, we would say that we have seven categories of fasts. So beginning from the strictest but highest and the most holy ones, we have first the fasting of complete fasting, that is, that we not eat or drink anything for one day or even more, analogous to our strength, as for example on Holy Friday, which many people keep all the years of their life. Because they wish to participate in this manner and mourn for man's unjust crucifixion of our Savior Christ, and they neither drink water or, as we said on Clean Monday, because it's the first day of the fast of Great Lent. 
The fast, aside from the things we mentioned previously, is also a type of personal mourning and cross on our shoulders for our disobedience and our sins, because with these we sat in our all-good God and Father. But let us not forget that the resurrectional always follows the crucifixion. Thus we also, when we crucify ourselves with fasting, but also each person with his own personal struggle, we can be sure that we will be granted to also see our spiritual resurrection and receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which the philanthropic God grants to the struggling Christians, but also the salvation of our soul for which there is not exchange. Secondly, we have the fasting of complete fasting, but drinking only water. Third is the fasting of dry food. That is, we eat only bread, halva, olives, tahini, greens. Fourth is the unoiled foods. That is, we eat food cooked, but cooked without oil, along with what we mentioned above. Fifth are the oiled foods. In this, we can eat foods with oil, salad with oil, and all the aforementioned as well, as in measure, a little wine, according to the Athenite model. Sixth is the fasting in which fish is permitted, in which we can eat fish and oiled foods, not cheese products, however. Seventh is the fasting of cheese fare, in which we can eat all of the above together with cheese, milk, products, kasiri, yogurt, eggs. Finally, we have a fast breaking in everything, where if we desire, we can also eat meat. We should be careful, however, because in great quantities, the toxins it contains harms the heart and many other parts of the body, whereas on the contrary, greens benefit. In all the above mentioned fasts, aside naturally from those of complete fasting, we must be careful not to eat a lot, because then it is not considered fasting. And usually the stomach fools us, shouting that it is empty, even if we've eaten, and then we fall into the sin of gluttony, even amongst the fasting type of foods. We see, my beloved brethren, with what amazing wisdom the holy and God-bearing fathers of our church appointed the fasts of the whole year for the health of the soul and the body. Thus, implementing the above fasts of foods, let us also chant along with the chanter, let us fast an acceptable fast, pleasing to the Lord. A true fast is estrangement from evils, restraint of the tongue, abstinence from anger, separation from desires, slanders, falsehoods, and false oaths. Poverty of these is a true and favorable fasting. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Matthew 13, verse 8. Let us not be lukewarm Christians, but fervent in faith and confessing our orthodoxy. The parable of the sower. Luke chapter 8, verses 5 to 15, 19 through 21. When out of love our Lord as all-wise God and creator of men and also the great knower of hearts of the ages, came to the earth, speaking in parables with wisdom, he classified his rational creatures according to their faith and spiritual state into four categories with the parable of the sower. For this reason, it is good for us to see its interpretation and simultaneously to consider in what category each of us belongs in, and if necessary, to make a beginning, a good beginning, for spiritual correction, ascent, improvement, and progress. So, when many people from all the cities had gathered to hear our Lord, he said, A sower went out to the field to sow a seed. And as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trodden underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew with it and choked it. And some fell into the good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. And as he said this, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when his disciples asked what this parable meant, he said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. Because of your good disposition, God has given you the grace and privilege to understand. But for others, they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. In other words, our Lord is saying, because they do not have a good disposition or interest to hear and receive the truth, I will guard them from the grave responsibility they would otherwise have before God 
if they were to understand and scorn his truth. I teach them in parables so that although they see, they cannot enter into the deeper meaning. And although they hear, they are not able to understand the truth. Only when people begin having a good disposition and struggle will they understand very well the truths I'm teaching. The meaning of this parable is this. The seed symbolizes the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts that they may not believe and be saved. That is, they hear, but they do not pay attention. And so the devil easily strips the word away from their hearts and they remain unsaved. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root. They believe for a while and in a time of temptation fall away. Even though they may receive the word with joy, yet because they have no deep spiritual roots in time of temptation, they depart from the faith. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. Though they receive the word and try to follow it with some eagerness, they don't follow it to the finish, and they bear no permanent fruit because of their anxious care to obtain wealth and the materialistic enjoyments of this life. And as for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bring forth fruit with patience. These are the people who of good disposition, who with a good and kind heart, who having heard the word of God, hold it with care and piety within themselves and have works of virtue together with patience, which they show in the various afflictions and adventures of life as the fruit of their struggle for virtue. While Jesus taught his mother and those who are, are thought to be his brothers came toward him, and they could not approach him on account of the people who surrounded him. Then some people approached him and told him that your mother and your brothers are standing outside and wish to see you. He answered and said, My mother and brethren are those who hear the word of God and do it. In other words, those who implement it put it into practice in their lives. Thus, my beloved Christians, if we wish to become brethren and friends of Christ, let us hear his words and keep his commandments. Let us ask him to help us to be granted to become fertile in good earth, to produce fruits worthy of repentance and to be able to inherit the throne of the Jerusalem above. Furthermore, let us all participate in the great meal of the faith and enjoy the wealth of goodness of our Lord who is worthy of worship. Amen. May God preserve us from political and religious false teachings and heresy and let us ask him to enlighten our darkness and give us fervor of faith. Brethren all over the earth, do not accept for whatever reason a mark on your body, your hands, your head with electronic computers nor plastic money cards but also identification cards with undistinguishable magnetic tapes because it is as the sacred book of revelations mentions in revelations 13 16 a plan of the dark powers and instruments of the devil for a worldwide imprisonment of the nations and subsequently the eternal death of the souls they wish to bring back the years of babel being indifferent for god's will which divided nations and made the tongues let us pray that christ guard us from such a type of ecumenical union, but also from satanic marks, which will lead to the self-destruction and perdition of both soul and body. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what can a man give in return for his life? Our Lord tells us in Mark eight thirty-six and 37, Be very careful, our brethren. Remember, O Lord, as being good thy servants, and all that they sinned in life forgive. For there is no one sinless except thee who art able and to, and to the departed grant rest. Synodicon of the Sunday of Orthodoxy As the prophets beheld, as the apostles have taught, as the teachers have received, as they have dogmatized, as the universe has agreed, as grace has shown forth, as Christ awarded, thus we declare, thus we assert, thus we preach Christ our true God. This is the faith of the apostles. This is the faith of our holy fathers. This is the faith of orthodoxy. This is the faith which has established the universe.
basic differences of the Roman Catholic and Papal Church with our Holy Orthodoxy. From the day the Westerners, the Papists, tore themselves away from the One Holy Apostolic and Catholic Orthodox Church, at various times they wrote letters to the ecumenical patriarchs, exhorting that all of us Christians must unite and supposedly have love. Well, this of course they did deceivingly and underhandedly, with the aim of throwing the Orthodox into their deception. The patriarchs usually responded that we have no hate for our brother Christians of the Western Church, but we want genuine love and we desire the union more than you, and the Eastern Orthodox Church is ready to accept with open arms all her children. Let them return, however, with humility to our patristic and apostolic traditions, and to become one flock with one and the same shepherd, our Master Christ, so that as long as you leave the egotisms behind, the wrong beliefs, the primacies and the various innovations which you created on your own, and the most basic of which are the following. First, the haughty, wicked, and sly primacy of the Pope, which is based on egotism and a lie that after God is the Pope and all others are under him, whether they're patriarchs or whomever else they be, even if they be saints. Second, the so-called infallibility of the Pope of Rome, who is self-proclaimed higher than all the sacred synods in which the greatest God-bearing holy fathers of our church participated and in which all together they made the various synodical decisions. Third, the filioque, that is the addition which he unilaterally made in the symbol of our faith, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son also. Whereas the patristic apostolic orthodox Eastern Church has as a dogma, as the Holy Fathers define synodically, that the Holy Spirit proceeds only from the Father Quote, which proceeds from the Father. Fourth, the sprinkling, which the Western Church invented instead of baptism, which the Eastern Orthodox Church does with three immersions in the Holy Trinity, to which baptism and not sprinkling, the Apostle Paul also refers. In Ephesians 4, 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism or as our Lord himself commanded his disciples. Matthew 20, verse 19. Going forth, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Fifth. In the divine liturgy, they used unleavened breads. As in the Old Testament, like the Jews do, whereas from the first years of the Orthodox Church to this day as well, we use leavened bread. That is, we use yeast. Sixth, the Papal Church imposes obligatory celibacy upon her priests, whereas Orthodoxy accepts following a synodical decision that married priests and married deacons as, can be married as long as they wish to be. Seventh, they changed the external dress of the clergyman, that is, they did away with the beards and the rasos, cassocks, being again indifferent about synodical decisions. However, in their craftiness, they permit these to, be, to the so-called uniates in order to deceive and entrap our brother Orthodox Christians of the Eastern and other countries. Eighth, to her believers, the Papal Church does not impart the actual body and blood of Christ, but it gives them the so-called wafers, something which resembles a small biscuit. Ninth, they accept purgatorial fire, that is, that after man's death the soul enters a certain place which burns, and which is a cleansing fire for the soul to be cleansed. That is, the papists accept a third condition of souls, aside from paradise and hell. Tenth, they changed the ecclesiastical and paschal celebratory cycle, resulting in their having Pascha prior to the Jewish Pesach, or concelebrating with the Jewish one, which Orthodoxy considers unacceptable, because the lawful Pesach must always precede and the Pascha, the resurrection of the Christians, as the holy and God-bearing fathers established and handed down to us, which they instituted at the first ecumenical synod. Eleventh, 
They placed statues and musical instruments in their churches like the ancient idol-worshipping temples. Twelve, they make the sign of the Holy Cross backwards. The Western Roman Catholic Church created other wrong beliefs so that her own she would be cut off from the genuine apostolic orthodox ecclesiastical tradition, with the result that from her dictatorial and luciferian egotism, a whole host of plethora of heresies would spring forth, such as the Protestants and various other Protestant heresies that continue to proliferate to today. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. 1 Corinthians 3.19 Exhortations As we approach the end of this little book, probably some among our Orthodox brethren, no matter how indifferent or lukewarm towards our living faith, will think that the Orthodox Church has quite a few musts and quite a few don'ts. Others, of course, might rejoice and see these few humble things which were written as a blessing of the Lord. However, for us to be sincere, we will not expand further so that we do not tire out the reader or listener, but let them not forget that the title of this small work is Guide of Orthodoxy and Orthopraxia, which without combining of both of these together, there does not exist a living faith and salvation. Let it not seem strange furthermore if we say that St. Maximus the Confessor reaches the point of saying about Orthodox Christians who live without correct ac action, without orthopraxia, that they're in delusion and a demonic state. Furthermore, St. John Chrysostom, approaching the topic, tells us word for word the following, quote, Ignorance of the scriptures is a great precipice and pit. It is a great betrayal of salvation to not know anything of the divine laws because this has given birth to heresies also, because this introduced a corrupt life, because this has made things upside down, end quote, St. John Chrysostom. Almost all the fathers of our Holy Church speak in this spirit about the ignorance and lack of orthopraxia, of correct action, from the life of the Christians. But if the baptized Orthodox Christian begins trying to implement and guard these basic things with a good disposition, struggling as much as he can with the most sweet struggle of orthodoxy, together with orthopraxia, at the same time humbly, without many and unending whys and hows, with the study of the Holy Scripture, however, of the Psalms and of patristic books, slowly but slowly and surely, he will draw the grace of God and with his help, together with the mediation and loving protection of the mother of all Orthodox Christians, our Panagia, and most blessed Theotokos of the holy archangels, together with our protector guardian angel of our so own soul and body, which each one of us has from baptism, and also of the choir of martyrs, confessors, and continent ones, and our God-bearing holy fathers and mothers as intercessors. And first of all, with the guidance of our spiritual father and confessor, we will be able to enter a correct road along the present temporal and ephemeral life. Furthermore, to withstand in soul and body periods of great temptations and difficulties, which perchance will break forth upon all of humanity, probably in our own country as well, and also so that we're ready to forbear any persecutions which the Christ-opposing dark powers also may break forth against our church and her members, but which probably will also be the last ones and will show forth very great saints and high orthodox statures and virtues. Because if we do not prepare ourselves from now, when we have time for repentance and the ease of struggling, there is a great danger that we will not stand it then, neither in soul nor physically. With these presuppositions and fortified, as we said, with the preparation of the struggle which we ought to have, we also will be saved and we will also help those around us and will benefit them. Always, however, I repeat once again, because only thus will we be saved. Closely surrounding ourselves, our virtuous, discerning, experienced, and enlightened spiritual father and confessor and the pious struggling clergyman with humility and obedience because all the Holy Fathers stress this, that obedience is life and salvation while disobedience is death, delusion, and perdition. We must always remember also that after death, there is no repentance. 
Let us glorify my beloved brethren in Christ, the philanthropic Trinitarian God who granted us to be enlisted in his Orthodox flock. Because if we'd been born elsewhere in the world, who knows, we might not have received this great gift. Let us ask him, however, to enlighten us with conscientiousness, to walk the road of orthodoxy, correctly dividing the word of God with orthopraxia. Let us furthermore thank him for each day which he grants to us, because it is time and opportunity for repentance and spiritual struggle. I think it would be worthy and righteous as a small sign of gratitude to cry out as a glorification toward our Heavenly Father from morning till night, if possible, and all night long, the glory to thee, O God, which simultaneously is a great prayer. If, however, our heart, our soul, and our being is aflame with more love toward our guileless Creator, let us hymn him and chant with contrition and tears in our eyes. Great art thou, O Lord, and wondrous are thy works, and there are no words sufficient to hymn thy wonders. From a prayer of the Great Holy Water Service. In finishing for all that was written above, I ask the readers and listeners, my brethren and sisters in Christ, to judge the author with leniency and pray for his unworthiness because he does not have a particular talent for this. This he decided as was written in the beginning with the aid of God, after much supplication and insistence of spiritual brethren in Christ, whom I also praise with my humble pen for the glory of God and their salvation, for their missionary zeal and the love they have for Christ, for the church and her priests, and also for their great interest for their fellow man and his salvation. May the merciful Lord grant according to their heart, firstly, humility, and may the Holy Spirit engrace them with all his fruits, that they be granted to become partakers and inheritors of the kingdom and reign of the heavens, together with all our saints from the ages. We humbly thank with fervency our consubstantial all-holy trinity, who enlightens, strengthens, empowers, heals the deficiencies, and completes what is lacking in people when it is good when it is for good works and also for the salvation of men as also the most holy theotokos the holy archangels and all the saints for their protection aid and consolation from the various temptations but also all who in various manners helped and labored for the publication of this small and humble work of love a fervent prayer for these brethren of ours is that they have much reward, mercy, blessing, and help from our compassionate Lord, and that they give a good defense in the day of judgment. In summary, we would say that the main purpose and attempt of us all together is love for the trihapostatic God and the struggle of the Church of Christ and her people for the salvation and spiritual life of all our co-journeying baptized Orthodox Christian brethren with the hope that we all may hear that blessed and thrice blessed voice of the Lord. Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom which was prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Matthew 25, verse 34. While to the unbaptized and to the heretics, the prayer of us all is that the Lord grant them a good repentance, who very clearly said, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 16. If also they have a living and activated faith in humility. In closing, I fervently beseech with tears the all good, Trinitarian, merciful, and philanthropic God, by the intercessions of the Most Holy Lady, the Theotokos, of the Holy Archangels, with all the precious heavenly, divine, immaterial, bodiless powers, and of all the saints, that He save us freely and grant all His heavenly kingdom. Amen. Signed, the least of all. Priest Michael. Concerning the commemoration of names. Something further which pious Orthodox Christians ought to pay attention to is that when they give little papers with names to the altar for the priest to commemorate in the proscomitee and to place the analogous particles, they ought to not write in these names of our fellow men who believe in other dogmas and other religions, nor of the heretics such as the Papists, the Protestants, the Jehovah Witnesses, and others, who have denied orthodoxy because, again, our Holy Church does not allow this. For these souls, we are only allowed and able to do individual prayer, and furthermore, to have them in our prayer ropes, our comboskinis, for them to receive mercy from God and to, to come to know the truth, the light, and the life, who is Christ, 
as he experienced it in our Orthodox faith, worship, and tradition. For mothers of small children, many mothers of small children who are pious question if they should or should not on Sundays and great feasts do any small but urgent work which concerns the children or the family. We respond that they can, of course, do these small jobs, even to wash a few infantile clothes or do any household chores, so long as they don't have others to change them in or to wash clothes if it is absolutely necessary, even to iron a few of them which are needed by the husband or the children, also if it is absolutely necessary to sweep a certain area, to do it. We must stress, however, that these jobs should be done, if possible, after the divine liturgy. It would not be proper, however, to do various jobs if we had the opportunity to transport them for a certain weekday. And on these holy days, we should look a bit at our soul, too, which has much need, and we should care for it and not neglect it. God, my beloved brethren, is love, long-suffering, and understanding. So long as we are obedient to our spiritual fathers who are so vigilant over our souls, we also ought to know that it is not bad always with discretion to ask and to learn, as Abba Dorotheus urges us, because thus man progresses spiritually and obtains virtues, simultaneously escaping the traps of the devil, because truth and knowledge are not pleasing to him, and he always wants people to live in ignorance and lack of learning. My brethren, we should ceaselessly ask our Christ to enlighten the darkness, as St. Gregory Palamas constantly prayed. Concerning the mediums and the likes. Many Christians, tempted by various difficulties and or illnesses, seek refuge for their above individual or family problems in mediums, hotzas, card readers, coffee cup readers, astrologists, and the like, or to various isolated individuals who exist in villages and cities with the reputation of supposedly holy people who have a pious appearance with icons and vigil lamps in their homes and all these in order to deceive people and that they supposedly speak with saints and foresee things happening in the future or that they have notification for various causes of trials where other, whereas there also are mediums so-called such people exist everywhere and are very well known to all of us so for this reason let's not refer to names we remind the pious orthodox christians that wherever obedience does not exist, there also does not exist blessing. The above mentioned people do not have any relationship with Christ and his church because they do not have obedience to an elder confessor. All fathers stress about the above people that they are instruments and colleagues with Satan. For this reason, whoever Christian ended up out of ignorance in such places transgressed and ought at the first opportunity to confess it to a priest, a spiritual father, because they sought refuge in instruments of the good-hating demon to be healed or to be informed of something which concerned them and they did not seek refuge through the church to the philanthropic creator of heaven and earth, our Lord Jesus Christ and God, through the mysteries and the prayers which our holy church has. So for this reason, be very careful in this matter also, my beloved brethren. Also, pious Christians are requested to not hang on the doors of their homes or in their cars horseshoes, garlic, little hearts, and various objects, but rather a cross, which is the support of the faithful and the wound of the demons. Marriage, friendship. Something which concerns those betrothed and which we should stress is that they should have their wedding on a Sunday, and not on a Saturday, because those invited, but also the couple itself, after the dance, which usually occurs, and the tiredness that they'll have, almost no one goes the next day to church, and thus harm is done to so many souls, but also to the newly married couple on a Sunday when they ought to go and ask God to bless and make firm their marriage, they are sleeping in. And maybe for this reason, my beloved brethren, many couples who don't live harmoniously in their common cohabitation is, is shaken in our days. The above custom is the cause. Let us ponder this, please, and let us remain faithful to our paternal traditions in this topic as well. As regards the obtaining of our friends, we ought to be very careful in this topic also because 
friends, so-called, play an important role in the life of each of us, each person, and either they benefit and edify us spiritually, or they create many problems and harm us morally. Because it is a great blessing and it is pleasing to God for us to keep our bonds with relatives and not to show indifference and aversion to them, so long as they are not harming us morally. Exhortations of the Second Edition My beloved brethren in Christ, the attacks which the soul accepts from the enemy of our salvation, the devil, the Holy Fathers liken as if they are coming from a wild beast. These occur in the beginning with particular rage and violence against Orthodox Christians, and even more so to those who are fervently interested in their salvation and who are struggling for it with God allowing it for man to be sanctified. Those, however, who live far from God without a spiritual struggle seemingly live without temptations. Essentially, however, they become prisoners of the tyranny of the devil and of their sins. My brother, if with the grace of our Lord you begin believing this reality and you perceive his traps, you ought to do nothing other than to bravely resist as a good soldier of Christ with the spiritual weapons of self-knowledge, of chastity, of vigilance, of humility, of continence, of silence, of constant repentance, of prayer, of meekness, of long-suffering, and of forgiveness. But also with realization and contrition, you approach the mysteries of confession of divine Eucharist and communion. Then as you will be fortified with these gifts of God, as a reward of your personal struggle, the inventor devil will not have strength and power over you. And from a beast, he will become an ant. Thus the soul, engraced and free, will traverse the road of holiness and slowly, slowly will begin to force taste paradise, even from here, from the earth, simultaneously also preparing the passport for the heavenly kingdom and reign, and the blessedness wherein is no pain, nor sorrow, nor sighing, but life everlasting. This great blessing and inconceivable benefaction, the philanthropic and compassionate God will grant to the strugglers and victors of the present deceiving age. My brother, something further which you ought to pay attention to is that since you consciously and sincerely decided to struggle, the spiritual struggle, for the acquisition of virtues, you ought to do humbly do what's in your power and to allow God to act in you for the rest. Because if you begin to be anxious for your salvation with anxiety, there's danger that the devil will steal you and throw you into sins of despondency and of despair. And then the last deception will be worse than the first. So for this reason, I urge you and simultaneously ask you to always have absolute trust in the compassionate Godfather and creator of all creation for whatever he will allow to happen to you and to never neglect for the good things, to glorify and for the seemingly difficult things, to forbear unmurmingly because, but also ceaselessly hymn him and glorify him. And let us never forget that he will not allow something to happen to us which we cannot bear nor carry. Finally, let us not forget that which the Lord told his disciples. He who forbears unto the end, he shall be saved. Matthew 10, 22. And the Apostle Paul saying, through patience we run the struggle before us. Hebrews 12, 1. Let us struggle, my beloved brethren, with faith and patience unmurmingly for everything of the present life. And let us be certain that with these presuppositions, the Lord will not deprive us of salvation and paradise. Amen. Your fellow traveler and brother in Christ and least priest of the Most High, Father Michael. The Ten Commandments of Orthodox Spouses. One, don't pretend to be a teacher to your spouse. The best way of changing him or her is to love him as your own self and to respect him. Two, Marriage is a constant but beautiful adventure which helps us discover our true self, the world of the soul of our spouse, and to know God in our house church. Three, we accept our spouse as he is with his weaknesses and his idiosyncrasies, and not as we would like him to be. The family is a palestra and exercising of souls, a gymnasium and a courtyard of paradise. Four, Try to understand your spouse. 
Don't forget that the husband thinks with dry logic, whereas the wife with emotion and the heart. Five, don't try to impose your opinion and to correct your spouse. Strive rather to correct your own self. Love lives with the harmony of oppositions and with forgiveness. Don't get angry. Six, with faith, patience, and love, all the difficulties of life are faced victoriously. Seven, the greatest enemy of married life is egotism. Attacking our spouse does not save us, but rather attacking our own egotism will save us. Eight, the best example for our children is for the father to love the mother and the mother the father and for the children to see them praying and attending church. Nine, the secret of family peace is for one to be able to forgive, to love, and to respect. Ten, marriage is a great mystery which begins in church and is renewed with holy confession, with the divine liturgy, and the remaining mysteries of the Orthodox Church and our living faith. Amen. Orthodox Kipsili Publications, Thessaloniki, Greece. Thank you.